about to hear the first episode of The Deer Slayer, dramatized and directed by Charles Frederick Lindsley. Leather Stocking Tales, written by James Fenimore Cooper, bring to you faithfully and in detail that historic character, Natty Bumpo, variously called by his Indian friends, Deer Slayer, Hawkeye, and the Pathfinder. No more thrilling story of daring and human courage in the face of perilous border odds was ever penned, and you are invited to follow this story as it is presented to you over the station. The incidents of the tale occur between the years of 1740 and 1745, when the settled portions of the colony of New York were confined to a narrow section on each side of the Hudson. Broad belts of virgin wilderness, stretching away into New England, afforded forest covers to the noiseless moccasin of the native warrior as he trod the secret and bloody warpath. The leafy surface of the forest lies bathed in the brilliant light of a cloudless day in June and the trunks of the trees rise in cloudy grandeur. As our curtain rises, a man of gigantic mold breaks from the tangled undergrowth into a small clearing. He is accompanied by a slender woodsman and scout, the hero and central figure of this tale, the Deer Slayer. Hurrah, Deer Slayer. Here's daylight at last, and yonder is the lake. Do you know this spot, Harry? Or do you shout at sight of the sun? Both, lad, both. My name is not Hurry Harry, if this not be the spot where the land hunters camped last summer. Ah, but this stomach of mine pints at late afternoon. Open the wallet and let's wind up for another six hours' run. We dare not risk a halt now with these lurking mingos likely to break out on us any minute. Ah, we haven't struck a trail for 24 hours, boy. Fall to and prove your manhood in this poor devil of a doe with your teeth, as you've already done with your rifle. There's little manhood in killing the doe. Though there might be some in bringing down a catamount. Then why have the Delawares named you Deerslayer? On account of a bold heart, as well as a quick eye and an active foot. Bah, the Delawares themselves are no heroes. Or they never would have allowed them loping vagabonds, the Mingos, to make them women. You don't understand the matter rightly. The Mingos fill the woods with lies and break their treaties. I have now lived ten years with the Delawares and know them to be as manful as any other nation when the proper time comes to stir. Okay, dear Slayer, we may as well open our minds. We haven't known each other very long. Did you ever hit anything human or intelligible? Did you ever pull a trigger on an enemy that was capable of pulling one on you? To own the truth, I never did. I hold it to be unlawful to take the life of a man except in open and generous warfare. The Delawares have been peaceful since my sojourn with them. What? Did you never find a fellow thieving among your traps and skins and do the law on him with your own hands? I'm no trapper, Hurry. I live by the right. A weapon of which I will not turn my back on any man of my years. I never offer a skin that has not a hole in its head besides them which nature made to see with or to breathe through. Aye, aye, this is all very well in the animal way. Though it makes but a poor figure alongside our scalps and ambushes. Shooting an Indian from ambush has acted up to his own... Now that we have a war on our hands, the sooner you wipe that disgrace off your character, the better man you'll be. I shall not keep your company long, friend. Unless you look higher than four-footed beast to practice your rifle on. Our journey is nearly ended, Master March. And we can part tonight, if you see occasion. I have a friend waiting for me who will think it no disgrace to consort with a fellow creature that has never yet slain his kind. I wish I knew what has brought your skulking Delaware into this part of the country. Where did you say this young chief was to give you a meeting? At a small round rock near the foot of the lake where the tribes resort to make treaties and bury the hatchet. <laughs> Common territory. I'd like to know what floating Tom Hunter would say to that. He claims the lake is his own property. And he'll not give it up to Mingo or Delaware without a battle for it. What will the colonies say to such a quarrel? Not a thing. Penn was never set to paper concerning hill or valley hereaway. What Tom claims, he'll likely maintain. But what I heard, Harry, this floating Tom must be an uncommon mortal. Uh, what's the man's history in Nader? His Nader's more muskrats than human. Some think he was a free liver on the salt water. 
A companion of a certain kid who was hanged for piracy. And he was wrong, Harry. A man can enjoy plunder peaceably nowhere. Some men have no peace if they don't find plunder, and some if they do. Old Tom seems to belong to neither set, as he enjoys his, if plunder he really has, with his daughters, in a very quiet and comfortable way, and wishes for no more. Ah, he has daughters, too. Is there no mother, Harry? There was once, but she's been dead and sunk these two good years. Sunk? Well, I hope that's good English. The old fellow lowered his wife in the lake. He thought water washes away sin sooner than earth, I reckon. Was the poor woman uncommon wicked that her husband should take such pain with her body? Not unreasonable. She couldn't have been to have had such a daughter as Judith. Ah, I've heard the name of Judith from the Delawares, too. From their words, I do not think the girl would much please my fancy. Thy fancy? What the devil have you to do with a fancy? And that, too, concerning one like Judith. You are but a boy, a sapling. Judith has had men for her suitors. She's not likely to cast a look upon a half-grown creature like you. It is June. And there's not a cloud between us and the sun. So all this heat is not wanted, Harry. Anyone may have a fancy. And a squirrel has a right to make up his mind touching a catamount. But might not be wise to let the catamount know it. Ah, but you're young and thoughtless. I'll overlook your ignorance. Come, we'll not quarrel about a light-hearted, jilting jay just because he happens to be handsome. Judith is only for a man whose teeth show the full marks. And it's foolish to be afraid of a boy. Yeah, but what do the Delawares say of the hussy? They said she was fair to look on, and pleasant of speech, uh, but overgiven to admirers and light-minded. The Delawares are devils incarnate. Now, that's Judith's character to a ribbon. It's all the truth, dear Slayer. I should have married the gal two years ago. It had not been for two particular things, one of which was this very light-mindedness. And what may have been the other? Uh, tell her was an uncertainty about her having me. <laughs> yeah, she has failings that I find hard to overlook. And sometimes I swear I'll never visit the lake again. Which is the reason you always come back. Nothing is ever made more sure by swearing about it. And if you knew all I know concerning Judith, you'd find a little justification for her cousin. You ought to see how she wears finery and the air she gives herself when the gallants come over from the forts on Lake Mohawk. That's unseemly in a poor man's daughter. The officers are all gentry. And they look on Judith only with evil intention. I know. I wish to look upon her as modest and becoming. And yet the clouds that drive among these hills are not more uncertain. If I was you, I would think no more of such a woman, but turn my mind to the forest. That'll not deceive you. If you know Judith, you'd see how much easier it is to say this than it would be to do it. Could I bring my mind to be easy about the officers, I'd carry the girl off to the Mohawk by force and make her marry me, spite her whiffling. And I'd leave old Tom to the care of Hetty, his other child. Who, if she be not as handsome or as quick-witted as her sister... Is much the most dutiful. Is there another bird in the same nest? Delaware spoke to me of only one. That's natural enough when Judith Hutter and Hetty Hutter are in question. Hetty is only comely. While her sister, I tell thee, boy, is such another as is not to be found between this and the sea. More than this, Hetty, I would say, is on the verge of ignorance. Even the Mingos know she's not just right in her mind, and she passes among them without harm. I see. She belongs to them beings the Lord has in his special care. For he looks carefully to all who fall short of proper share of reason. The Redskins honor and respect them that are so gifted, knowing that the evil spirit delights more to dwell in an artful body than in one that has no cunning to work upon. Ah, but tell me, Harry, uh, what reason have you to believe this gal has waited for you in the six months you've last seen her? I haven't the gal's faith, I know. But if she's dared to marry in my absence, she'll be like to know the pleasure of widowhood before she's 20. You would not harm the man she's chosen, Harry, simply because she found him more to her liking than yourself. Why not? If an enemy crosses my path, will I not beat him out of it? Look at me. Six foot four. Am I a man to let any sneaking skin trader get the better of me in a manner that touches me as near as the kindness of Judith Hutter? Besides, when we live beyond the law, we must be our own judges and executioners. And if a man should be found dead in the woods, who is there to say who slew him? Even admitting the colony took the matter in hand and made a stir about it. If that man should be Judith Hutter's husband after what has passed, I might tell enough at least to put the colony on the trail. You, you half-grown venison hunting bantling! You dare to think of informing against Harry Harry in so much as a matter touching a mink or a woodchuck? I would dare to speak truth, Harry, concerning you or any man that ever lived. Why, you traitorous sneaking reptile! I'll choke you to... You may shake, Harry, until you bring down the mountain. But nothing but truth will you shake from me. It's probable that Judith Hutter has no husband to slay. 
and you may never have the chance to waylay him. Else would I tell her of your threat in the first conversation I held with the gal. I thought we had been friends, dear Slayer. But you've got the last secret of mine that'll ever enter your ears. I want none of it to be like this. I know we live in the woods, Harry, and are thought to be beyond human laws. And perhaps we are so, in fact. But there is a law, and a lawmaker, that rules across the whole continent. He that flies in the face of either need not call me friend. Damn me, dear Slayer, if I don't believe you're at heart a Moravian. And no fair-minded, plain-dealing hunter as you pretended to be. Fair-minded or not, Harry. You'll find me as plain-dealing in deeds as I am in words. No, oh, but this giving away to sudden anger is foolish. Proves how little you've lived with the red man. Judith Hutter is no doubt still single. And we'll say and think more about it. I would have been foolish to have called about an idea. The sun is turning toward the afternoon sky. We'd better strike the trail again and make forward so we can get an opportunity of seeing these beautiful sisters. Hmm, that's odd. I haven't heard a loom this early in the woods before. Listen, Harry. You may be a good woodsman, but your ears deceive you this time. That's a poor imitation. That's no feathered bird. You mean a red man's signal or I'm a half beat. The Hurons are all around us, man, and they know our location. Oh, we've carried too long with our hot words. The lake is at hand, dear Slayer. If we can get off to old Tom's castle, we're safe. Our present duty is to find your hidden canoe. Are you sure you can recognize the spot? Yes. It's in a hollow basswood. It ought not to be more than a hundred yards off. When did you get the word that the Mingos had taken to the warpath again? The news came to the fort two weeks ago. Any cause? Nothing but their natural cussedness. There's a sign of the varmints again, if you'll be right. And our scalps grow more precious every minute. Ah, but we'll circumvent them. See the crooked branches of that sapling hooked on the branches of the basswood? That's the spot. Are you certain? It's my mark. I did it last winter when the young thing was bent down with snow. I fixed it then as my landmark. And that must be your log a hundred feet ahead. Hey. Listen. That's them. Lend a hand, dear Slayer. It's the canoe, all right. As snug as if it had been left in an old woman's cupboard. Lend a hand and we may afloat in a minute. Let the varmints yell. They'll have to swim for us if they want our scalp. About to hear another episode of The Deer Slayer, dramatized and directed by Charles Frederick Lindsley. Hurry, hurry, are making their way to the palace of old Tom Hutter, a stout defense in the middle of a large lake in northern New York. The woods are filled with a band of Iroquois Indians on the warpath. The two white men have almost reached the edge of the lake in safety when they are startled by imitation bird calls, which they recognize as the presence of the enemy. Hurrying to an old hollow basswood, Harry finds a hidden canoe. And the two men push into the placid water just as the cries of their pursuers break out some distance away. The canoe is a hundred yards from the shore before the first arrow touches a bowstring. Luck was with us, Hurry. Or we be prisoners by this time. Judging by their sounds, the Mengwe had cut off every retreat through the woods. Is this the only canoe on the lake? There are two more, but they're hid so no redskin can find them. 
The devils will have to make a raft if they want to pursue us. What's that I see off there abreast of us? Seems too small for an island and too large for a boat. Now, that's Muskrat Castle, where Tom Hutter lives. That's the stationary house you see now. He has another one that floats, sometimes called the Ark, though I don't know why. It must come from the missionaries, Harry. They say the Ark was once covered with water, and that Noah, with his children, was saved from drowning by building a vessel he called an Ark. Ah, but where do you suppose Hutter is now? Down south, no doubt, anchored in one of the bays, fishing or trapping. But we'll be at the castle in a minute, and we can wait for him to return. Ah, but this is a wonderful spot, Harry. Who calls himself lawful owner of these glories? None but the king, lad. But he's so far away that his claim will never trouble Tom Hutter, who's likely to keep it as long as his life lasts. He's a squatter, then? <laughs> I call him a floater. Anyway, I envy the man. I envy him. This is a sight to warm the heart. You've only to marry Hetty to inherit the castle. You take Hetty off the old man's hands, and I'll engage you'll give you an interest in every deer you can knock over within five miles of the lake. Ah, now you can get a better view of the castle. It's located safe enough. It's half a mile from where we took the lake and two miles to the furthest point. Why, it's just a regular house almost, built on piles. How deep's the water out here? There's a kind of shoal at this place which made the building easy once old Tom had brought off his logs from the bank. It must have taken a long time. Why did he build out here, anyway? The old fellow was burned out three times ashore. Three times between the Indians and the hunters. And in one fray with the Redskins, he lost his only son. No one can attack him here without coming in a boat. And the plunder they'd get would hardly be worth the trouble digging out canoes. And besides, old Tom is well supplied with firearms and ammunition. I guess you don't overrate the strength of his position from a military view. I notice the sides are made of tree trunks stood up on end. Yes, you're right, Master March. He could stand off an exposed enemy from there with little trouble and less danger. Well, we've arrived, dear Slayer. Pull up here. Old Tom calls this front platform here his dooryard. And the gallants from the fort call it the court. The castle court. Castle court? Yes. Now, what a court can have to do here is more than I can tell, seeing there is no law. Hello, Tom. Anybody go home? I say, Hunter! Eh... Uh, just as I thought. Not a soul here. All off on a voyage of discovery, I guess. Shall we wait here for them to get back? Old Tom has taken to a new con recently. Has been trying his hand at the traps. I guess that's where he's gone, down to the other end of the lake. We better try to find him, I guess, and let him know about true conditions of things in the woods. That is, if he hasn't found out already. We'll probably find him in the south outlet. I could content myself sitting here on this platform, watching the pines paint their pictures on this blue water. But I see you're thinking more of the beauties of Judith Hutter than those of this lake. I'll go along with you. So Hutter was burned out three times, you say, by the Mingos. Well, from what the Delawares tell me, I set the Mingui down as thorough miscreants. Aye, you may do that with a safe conscience. Or any other savage you meet. That's not so of all red men, Hurley. I've lived with the Delawares many years. And I know them to be generous and well-meaning people. The Indians are devils as a rule only when imposed on by the white man. Dear Slayer, you'll allow that a Mingo is more than half devil. But you'd persuade me that the Delaware tribe is made up of angels. White is the highest color, and therefore the best man. Black is next, and is put to live in the neighborhood of the white man as tolerable. And red comes last. Which shows that those that made him never expected an Indian to be accounted more than half human. God made all three alike, Harry. Alike? Do you call me like oh, an Indian? Oh, you go off at half cock and don't hear me out. God made us all. White, black, and red. He made us in the main much the same in feelings. Though he gave each race its gifts, a white man's gifts are Christianized, while the redskins are more for the wilderness. A white man cannot ambush women and children in war, but a redskin may. It's lawful work for them, but for us it would be grievous and unlawful work. That depends on your enemy. As for scalping a savage, I look upon that pretty much the same as cutting off the ears of wolves for bounty. Or stri stripping a bear of its hide. You know the county pays a bounty for a scalp just as it does for wolves' ears and crow's heads? Ah, in a bad business it is, Hurley. In a state of lawful warfare, it's our duty to keep our state of compassionate feelings. But when it comes to scalps, it's a different matter. But it's useless for us to talk of these things. We have our own ideas. 
Let's keep a good lookout for your friend, Tom Hutter. We may pass him if he lies hidden under this bushy shore. I have been looking for him. Is it possible the old chap has dropped down the river? The river? Yes. Most of these lakes, you know, have outlets. There's a narrow river off this one, not far to our right. Where's the outlet? I see no opening in the banks of the trees that looks as if uh, it would let a river run through it. It passes between high, steep banks. The pines and basswoods or hang it. I guess we better start over there now. Don't you think uh, we're skirting pretty close to the shore for safety? Ah, uh, it's two miles across to where we first heard the varmints. They'd hardly be all around the lake. Anyway, we'll see the ark before long. Old Tom is up in these bushes somewhere looking at his traps. Listen, Harry. What is that noise on the bank there? It was too heavy for any light creeder. Was it the tread of a man, do you think? No, not a man. The tread was too heavy. Push into that log. I'll land and cut off the creeder's retreat up to the plank yonder. Be it a mingo or only a muskrat. There you are, dear Slayer. It's a buck. He's coming down to the plank yonder. I'll get him. Hurry. You're a fool. To... Ah, it's a miss, dear Slayer. Hey, but we can catch him before he swims across the neck there. Here, get back in the canoe. I say you're a fool, Hurry, to pull the trigger before we had recognized the shore and made certain that no enemies lurk about. I tell you, the engines are at the far end of the lake from here. More than that, we don't want for food. My name may be Deerslayer, but I never kill an animal lest I need food or a skin. And I still say your shot may be a signal to the enemy. It'll be a signal to old Tom to put the pot on. Come on, let's hunt up the ark before the sun goes down. Is that the ark, Hurry? Breaking out of that bank of bushes? If my natural learning didn't teach me better, I'd think it a miracle that a boat like that could come right out of the trees. Those trees grow down over the mouth of the river where Hunter has his traps. Hey, ahoy there, Hunter. Let up on your sweep and take a couple of passengers. Hurry. You become more reckless every minute. What with your rifle shooting and your bellowing like a bull, there'll be no earthly chance of dodging the circling redskins. Hello, Hurry. Draw up and we'll give you a hand. When we get aboard that ark, dear Slayer, its stout cabin will protect your carcass. Hey, hello, Tom. Meet Deerslayer here. He carries the best rifle in the woods. Oh, was that his piece we just heard? No, it was mine. It was a bad shot at a buck that got away. Hey, where are the gals, Tom? They're inside taking the kinks out of a mess of tackle. I looked for you last week, hurry. A runner come down to warn all the trappers and hunters that the colony and the Canadas were in trouble again. And I felt lonesome with three scalps to see to and only one pair of hands to protect them. That's reasonable. If I had two such daughters as Judith and Hetty, I'd tell the same story. In general, though, I'm satisfied to have my nearest neighbor 50 miles off. I notice you didn't come into the wilderness alone this time, though. Why should I? Seeing Deerslayer here as a noted hunter among the Delawares. Should we have occasion to defend our traps, he'll be useful. Young man, you are welcome. In such a time, a white face is a friend's. I count on you as support. Are the savages close by as far as you know? Why, we barely escaped them some hours ago. No man can say how close they might be on us now. Then this ark is in an unfortunate position. I think we'd better get away from the mouth of this river. I'll pull up these lines and we'll start back to the castle. What's your iron in this quarter, Deerslayer? Tis soon told, Tom. When the news come among the Delawares where I live that wampum and a hatchet were to be sent into the tribe, they wished me to go out among my own people and get the exact state of things. And this I did, and after delivering my talk to the chiefs, I met an officer of the Crown who had money to send to the tribes further west. This was thought a good chance for me and Chingakook, the young chief who's never struck a foe, to go on our first war path in company. An appointment was made for us to meet at a rock at the foot of this lake. He used to meet me at sunset tomorrow evening. I fell in with Harry here, who was starting for these parts, and we agreed to journey in company. I was in the woods this afternoon, and I found this moccasin in a trail. Maybe they both belong to your friend, who's come ahead of his time. Can you tell me if this is Delaware fashion? Let's see. No, that's not Delaware made. Hmm. I should say that the moccasin has a northern look, and... Come from beyond the lakes. If that's the case, you did wrong, Hurry, to fire in wartime without good occasion. Take hold of this sweep and we'll get underway. It's getting dark in this river mouth, and I'll be glad to get into the light of the lake again. Although I don't think there's Look any... out for that sapling that hangs low in the water just ahead on your right there, Hurry. Look there, Tom. In the branches of that beech tree. Up on the second limb. What do you see? Tell me, but your eyes are keen, friend. They're Indians, or my name's not Tom Hutter. And there's six of them. 
I was right about the moccasins. They're in war paint, Deerslayer. We're trapped. Pull, Harry. Pull for your life as you love Judith Hunter. Pull, man. Pull. Harry Harry and Deerslayer have reached Muskrat Castle, the fort-like house which Tom Hutter has erected in the lake. But the Hutters are not at home. Harry finally locates them in an outlet of the lake where they are fishing. The old man is soon acquainted with conditions in the forest, and their large flatboat, called the Ark, is headed back toward the lake when Deerslayer suddenly sights a number of painted Indians lined up on an overhanging tree. Hurry at the sweeps, hears Hutter call. Pull for your life, Hurry, pull! The ark sweeps forward as the woods are filled with savage yells and rifle bullets patter against the logs of the ark. But the ladder is soon in the lake and past immediate danger. The present act opens at Muskrat Castle several hours later. Well, hurry, your enormous strength was never put to better use than tonight. If you hadn't got the ark into such quick motion, there'd have been a nice little party on board. But we're safe now for the present behind these stout logs. There's not a canoe on the lake that I don't know where it's hid. There are two, but they're so snug in hollow logs that they'll ne'er be found. There's no telling that, Harry. A hound is not more certain on the scent than a redskin. It'll be a tight log that will hide a canoe from his eyes. You're right, Deerslayer. Uh, Judith, find our friend's food. A long march gives a sharp appetite. We're not starving, Master Hunter. We just filled up as we reached the lake. Nature is nature and must be fed. Judith, see to the meal. And take your sister to help you. We'll have something ready, Father, shortly. Though I wish I might stay a moment and help you plan your campaign against our enemies. Indian warfare is not a woman's concern, Judith. Now, you leave that to us. Yes, but a woman's wit is often the strong man's best aid. That may be, lass, but we don't need you now. Come, Hetty. I wanted the girls away, friends, because I wanted to hold talk with you both. This matter looks serious. Your ideas will greatly relieve my mind. It's my notion, old Tom, that you and your huts and traps are in desperate jeopardy. Yes. And I have children. Good girls, too, I say, if I am their father. And one of them has an arecal on the frontier for good looks. May I depend on you, dear Slayer, to stand by me and my daughters? That you may, Floating Tom. And I think you can count on Harry, too. I say you won't be able to count on Harry. Hurry is his nature as well as his name. And he'll fly away as soon as he thinks his fine figure is in danger. But we can rely on Deerslayer. Your honest face and heart tell me you will perform your promises. Leave us, Judith. Leave us. And don't return until you bring venison and fish. And the foolish girl's been spoiled by the flattery of the officers. Uh, don't think any harm of her silly words, Harry. I scarce know Judith any longer. I'll soon take to admiring her sister. Then you're coming to your right senses, Harry. 
And he'd make a much safer companion than Judy. Uh, no man need want a safer wife than Hetty, though I'll not answer for her being the most rational. But dear Slayer's right, Tom. I'll not desert you. Mm, but let's get to a business of another sort. You know that high prices are offered for scalps on both sides? Yes, I know that. Mm, it isn't right, perhaps, to take gold for human blood. Yet, when mankind is busy killing one another, there can be no great harm in adding a little bit of skin to the plunder. What's your sentiment, Harry, touching this point? You make a mistake, old man, in calling savage blood human blood. I think no more of a red-skinned scalp than I do of a pair of wolf's ears. Mm, that's manly. I knew you'd be on my side. Dear Slayer, I suppose you're of hurry's way of thinking. I've no such feeling. My gifts are not scalpers' gifts. I'll stand by you in the ark, the castle, or canoe. But I'll not unhumanize my neighbor by following the way that God intended for another race. Harry, Harry, that's a lesson you might learn and practice to advantage. Move further off, Judy. Now, no more of this. We're bound to talk of matters unfit for a woman to listen to. Hurry, the young man's entitled to his belief. Uh, we can leave the children in his care. There's a large party of these savages on the shore, but they may be hunters who've been out so long they haven't heard of the War of the Bounty. In which case, why was their first salute an attempt to cut our throats? We don't know that their design was so bloody. It's natural and easy for an Indian to fall into ambushes. I saw the Mingos, and they were in their war paint. They're on the trail of mortal men, and not deer. Oh, I didn't see the paint. If Deerslayer says it was paint, then paint it was. Yeah, but I saw the print of women's moccasins. Would they have women with them if they were on the warpath? It may be that the warriors have come out to call in their women and children, to get in an early blow. Anyway, if there is women and children, the colony pays for all scalps alike. More shame that it should be so. Ah, uh, hearken to reason, lad. The savages scalp your friends. Why shouldn't we scalp? One good turn deserves another. Ah, oh, Master Harry, is it religion to say that one bad turn deserves another? I'll never reason against you, Judy. For you beat me with beauty if you can't with sense. Well, here's the Canadas paying their Indians for scalps. And why not we pay... Our Indians? Oh, Father. Father, think no more of this. And listen to the advice of Deerslayer. Ah, Deerslayer, you're young and don't understand the ways of the forest. If your enemy be fierce, then you must be fiercer. That's not the missionary teaching. Some of the Moravians say that if you are struck ah, on... Ah, that for your Moravian missionaries. Who ever heard of mercy for a muskrat? Where's your tinder, Tom? Let's have a light. Here, yeah, hold hard, Harry. We, we, we want no lights tonight. They prove a beacon to our enemies. Well, we ought to be safe enough here in the castle. Oh, in open daylight, I shouldn't fear a host of savages. What with three or four trusty weapons and killed here in particular. But it's different at night. A canoe might get on us unseen. But the enemy has no canoe, Tom. You know that. There are only five canoes in these parts, and we have three with us, and the other two are housed on the shore in hollow logs, safe from the eyes of even prowling redskins. Ah, but in the morning, they'll leave no likely place unexamined. The Indian don't live that can find a canoe that's suitably wintered. My opinion is that these canoes should be got off to the castle, and the sooner it's done, the better. What do you think, dear Slayer? I agree with Tom, and I'll follow you, Hutter, even into the Mingo camp on such an hour. Well, I don't expect you'll prove much of a warrior, dear Slayer. Though your equal with bucks don't exist in all these parts. <laughs> we'll see, Harry. We'll see. At any rate, you can use a paddle, and that's all we'll ask of you tonight. I think we'd better take to a canoe and do instead of talking. The decision is the right one. We must get those two canoes. I'll follow, old Tom. and ears for these varmin has noses like bloodhounds. There'll be signs of a campfire if they've stopped near this bank. Or at least there should be smell of wood smoke. You sent anything, Harry? Not a thing. Unless I be mistaken, the first canoe lies about 50 yards west. Uh, there's a piece of gravel beast just ahead. Uh, pull up there and we'll reconnoiter her a bit. Uh, you stay with the bark, dear Slayer, while Hurry and me look about. Mm. It's quiet as death. If they're about here, they certainly are giving us no warning. Is that the log just below you there? Yeah, uh, this is it. Here, in this linden. Uh, hand me the paddles first, and then draw the boat out with care. The wretches may have left it for a bait after all. Keep your rifle handy. If they attack, we want to unload the piece at them at least. All right, all right. Now move slow when you get your load. Ready? All safe, dear Slayer. One boat less for the enemy. We'll just tow this out about a hundred yards, and the breeze will send it toward the castle. 
Where's the other one hidden? It's down where Hurry tried to shoot his deer this afternoon. We'll have to be more careful now, for we're certainly under an enemy country. Yeah, this one will be harder to get off, because it's farther up the bank and it's in a tangle of dead wood. Uh, we'll have to swing it up on the branches of Low Elm and drop the canoe to you from above, dear Slayer. Swing up. I hope the enemy are not close. No woodsman could perform this feat with enough silence not to give away his position. Can you see your way, hurry? No, but I got feelers. Ooh, ooh, hey, what's that? Ooh. Oh, don't be womanish. It's an owl. Stop talking and feel out for the law. Uh, here it is. The boat? Snug as a bug. Give me a lift. Yeah, come along. Oh, below there, dear Slayer. Are you ready? Let her down. Now we've freed the scabs. Mm. If they want to visit the castle, let them swim. We'll strike for the ark, dear Slayer, and you can follow. Let us paddle along the south shore first and see if we can find a sign of encampment. I suggest you look into the bay first. We're not sure of that quarter yet. You'd not better go along, lad, because there may be trouble. I think I'd better go along, as I agree. Well, I'm thinking of the gals. They must have your protection if anything happens to us on this excursion. I advise you not to land, Hutter. That all depends, son. Look, Tom, through those alders on the right... It's a dying brand. It's the remains of a campfire. I'll wager there's enough bounty sleeping around that fire to make us rich. You land us, dear Slayer, and let us do a better war path for ourselves. Uh, you're right, Harry. Do as we say, dear Slayer. Land us. We'll call if we find danger we can't find a way out of. I wish you wouldn't undertake this matter, Tom. Your wishes can't be allowed. There's bounty money in that camp, and that ends the matter. Now paddle off in the lake and wait for a signal. Uh, this is good. Now, shove off now, dear Slayer. You follow me, hurry. This little excursion needs caution. We might find the place deserted. There are only women around that fire. Our work will be easy. If there are any braves, we'll have to move fast. How far away do you judge the fire to be? Oh, just a few yards. There isn't enough light to give much information. Well, if it's a war party, they must have sent me. Shh. I can see figures now. Braves? Squaws, I think. Ah, uh, then our work will be easy. Uh, unless the men are watching from behind these trees. Look out for that road, Harry. Look out. Uh, uh, We're coming, uh, son. Uh, it's a fight for our life now. Come on, you pain and reptiles. And see if a dozen of you is a match of Harry Harry. Uh, uh, fight your way to the oak, Harry, or we'll give him the slip. Uh, Slippery uh, devil, it's skin grease. Uh, there, uh, take that for your cunning. Uh, this way, Harry. Uh, there's three of the vermins on me. I can't handle them all. Uh, there's a mountain on me. Uh, let up, you pain and reptiles. Let up. I'm tied like a slow log now. Here, stop choking me. Why are you still You must come ashore. Keep off the land, lad. Keep off. The gals depend on you now. Keep off and eat my children. You've just heard another episode of The Deer Slayer. Dramatized and directed by Charles Frederick Lindsley. to hear another episode of The Deer Slayer, dramatized and directed by Charles Frederick Lindsley.
Tom Putter and Hurdy Harry, together with Deerslayer, have gone to the shore of the lake to find two canoes they have hidden in hollow logs. The woods are occupied by Indians on the warpath, and this is the only way to keep them from an immediate attack upon Hutter's house in the lake. The canoes are found and set adrift, and old Tom suddenly sights the embers of a campfire. He and Hurry decide to steal upon the encampment and take as many scouts as possible. They leave Deerslayer in the canoe and steal off into the darkness. All is quiet for a few moments, and then Deerslayer is startled by the rifles of his friends, the outbreak of angry voices, and old Hutter shouting to him, Keep off the land, lad. Keep off. The present episode takes place at Hutter's lake house. It is just before dawn. Deerslayer has not returned, and the two daughters, Judith and Hetty Hutter, are discussing their situation. It's almost dawn, and Father hasn't returned. Do you suppose those rifles we heard last night mean he's in trouble? I think not, Hetty. They're probably having difficulty in finding the canoes, and are still on the lake. Tell me, Jude, was it the canoe only Father wanted? I must be honest with you. They did go for the canoes, but Father and Harry also want scalps with which to collect the government bounty. Scalps? Oh, Judith, why should they kill people, especially women and children? They shouldn't, but they hide behind the fact that we are at war and that the Indians would do the same to us. Does dear Slayer want to take scalps, too? No, Hetty, no. If your mind were not weak, you could tell as much by his face. Dear Slayer has too honest a heart to take useless blood. He told Father and Hurry they shouldn't go on this mission. Do you like our new acquaintance, dear Slayer? He isn't handsome. Hurry is far handsomer than he. Well, that may be true, girl, but it's not everything to be handsome. I wish I was as handsome as you, Judith. Why so, poor child? One's beauty may cause her trouble. Hurry says that beauty's everything in a young woman. <laughs> oh, Hurry's like the officers from the garrison. He flatters. He's never sincere. You think dear Slayer is sincere? I haven't talked with him yet, but I believe he has a true wilderness heart. Plain... Simple and honest. Judith. Judith, I hear someone at the landing. Can it be? Shh. Stay away from the door, Hetty. Keep quiet. It may be father. Listen. Judith. Hetty. Oh, it's all right, Hetty. It's dear Slayer. Oh, dear Slayer, are you alone? Where's father and, and hurry, Harry? Are they with you? Did you see the Indian? Did... Not so fast, girl. My story is long and not to be blurted out in a single yes or no. Shall I make a light? No. The ark must remain dark. The light will be coming up over the eastern ridge in half an hour. Sit down and I'll tell my story in a few words. It's bad news. Father! He's met with misfortune. And there's no use in concealing it. He and Hurry are in Mingo hands. And heaven only knows what's to be the termination. Did you find the canoes? No, that story's almost as bad as the other one about your father, Judith. Yes, we found the canoes all right. And your father set them adrift thinking the night breeze would send them in this direction, and that they would be close at hand by morning. You can't mean you've lost them. No, it was too black to tell much of anything on the water. And I may be mistaken, but it's my judgment that the wind carried the canoes out of line with the ark here. And it's hard to say how far off they be now. Well, maybe when it's light, we may find them within a few yards of the ark. And again, we may find them drifted clean to the other shore. And if that's happened, we can expect a visit within a few hours. No, this situation is a desperate one, lass. And I would be dishonest not to inform you. But as soon as I can have a bite to eat, I'm going out to pick up the boats wherever they be. Unless the Redskins have already captured them. I shall go with you, dear sir. No, girl. The Indians have rifles. And it's a dangerous mission, I tell you. Let her go, dear Slayer. Judith can paddle a canoe as well as a man. You may need her. But you shouldn't be left alone, Hetty. You needn't think of me. The Indians know that I have a weak mind. They've never offered me harm. She's right, friend. I could be of little value here if our enemies attack. And as Hetty says, she'll not be harmed in any case. This is a common war now, and I insist on going with you. I advise against it, Judith. But if you're determined... I'll get you some food, and you can start while it's still dark. We'll need dawn for our errand. But it'll be light in a few minutes now. We'll soon know if the canoes are still afloat.
I'll handle the canoe for a while now, dear Slayer. You can search for the other canoes. Is there any sign of them yet? They must be near the shore if they haven't been already picked up. But we'll soon know because we've covered every part of the lake except the south end here. If we find them, do you think we'll be safe until the soldiers from the fort come? <laughs> soldiers? Why, they may not hear of this affair for weeks. And by that time, the Redskins can build a dozen rafts. But for the present, we'll be safe. What can we do to rescue Father and Harry? I have no plan yet, Judith. Will the Mingos hold them captive? Or... I can't say, girl. They went out on an evil mission. And red men's nature ain't white man's. They may pay in kind. The Lord only knows. But surely we can do something. When Chingakook comes, we'll have a council. Perhaps the two of us can make a plan. Chingakook? Who's he? He's a young Delaware chief sent out by his tribe to report on these conditions. I'm to meet him by the big rock tonight at sunset. Do you think this Delaware can be depended on, dear Slayer? As much as I can myself. You do trust me, Judith. You? I've known you but a few hours, but you have awakened the confidence of a year. Your name, though, was not unknown to me. The gallants of the garrison frequently speak of the lessons you've given them in hunting and shooting, and all proclaim your honesty. What's the English name of your Delaware friend? Big Serpent. So-called for his wisdom and learning. Well, if he has this wisdom, we may expect the useful friend in him. Unless his own business in this part of the country should prevent him from serving us. I see no great harm in telling you of his errand. Chingakook is a comely Indian. And there's a chief that has a daughter called Watawa. The rarest gal among the Delawares. Chingakook fancied her and she fancied him. But several weeks ago, Watawa went with her father and mother to fish salmon on the western streams. Chingakook lost sight of her. And then a runner brought a message that the girl had disappeared from her parents. That she had been stolen and was now with the Mingos. And was to be married to one of the enemy. Well, how does this concern you, dear Slayer? It concerns me as all things that touches a friend concerns a friend. I'm here to help Chingakook get back his sweetheart. Look, dear Slayer. There's one of the canoes. Yonder on that sunken rock about three yards from the shore. Good. Pull in close, Judith, and I'll pull it free. Look sharp, dear Slayer. There may be an ambush beyond. Lie down to the canoe, Judith. You're right. But he missed us, and there's only one of them. And he'll have to reload. There he goes, in the bushes on the right. Quick, dear Slayer. Oh, I can't shoot an uncovered foe, even if he is a red skin. Oh, but he's up there now reloading. You can take him before he has time to fire again. No, no. That may be a red skin warfare, but it's not a Christian gift. Land me on this rock and push back in the lake. I'll take this oak for protection and give him an even chance. This away, Redskin. This away if you're looking for me. It rests on you whether it's war or peace between us. I'm not one of them that thinks it's valiant to slay human mortals singly in the woods. That's right. Come down and talk it over. But mind that rifle. Mm. Two canoes. One for you, one for me. No, no. You own neither. And neither shall you have as long as I can prevent it. Go your way and leave me go mine. The world is large enough for us both, and when we meet fairly in battle, why, the Lord will order the fate of each of us. Good. Brother missionary, great talk. Not so. I'm only a hunter. My brother very young, but wise. Little warrior, great talker. Chief sometime in council. I'm only a hunter, I tell you. And I want my life to be a peaceful one. Old wisdom. Young tongue. My canoe, mine. Your canoe, yourn. Go. Look. If yourn, you keep. If mine, I keep. That's just, Redskin. Come down to the shore and look. Good. There it is. Take a good look. Is it yours? No, mine. Pale face canoe. No want other man's canoe. Farewell, brother. You go back muskrat house in water. Injun go to camp. Tell chief no fine canoe. Goodbye, Mingo. <laughs> That's more reason than I expected out of an Iroquois. I'll push this canoe off, Judith, and we can go on. Look behind you, Dislayer. He hasn't gone. Aha. Uh -huh. 
Dear say I was too quick for you, Redskin. You're a poor shot with a rifle like most of your friends. But you have nothing to fear from me now. Water. Give engine water. Water you shall have if you drink the lake dry. I'll carry you down to it. Uh, it would be sinful in me not to tell you your time hadn't come, warrior. You'll soon find the happy hunting grounds if you've been a just engine. Good. Young head, old wisdom. Old engine die. How engine call white man? Deerslayer is the name I bear now. A good name for boy. Poor name for warrior. No fear in white man's breast. Eyes harden. Finger lighten. No more deer slayer. Hawkeye. Hawkeye. Uh, Hawkeye. Is he dead, deer slayer? I didn't want to take his life. But he left me no choice between killing and being killed. But we'll have to find that other canoe at once, Judith. This man will be found by his friends at any minute, and their fury will drive them to Muskrat Castle in another hour. about to hear another episode of The Deer Slayer, dramatized and directed by Charles Frederick Lindsley. Slayer and Judith Hutter have left their house in the middle of the lake to find the two canoes which were lost in the night. They have found one which drifted close to the shore, but in rescuing it, Deer Slayer has his first encounter with the enemy and is forced to shoot an adversary in self defense. He and Judith have taken to the water again in search of the second canoe. I didn't want to take his life, Judith, but I had to. Or he would have taken mine. You should be very proud, dear Slayer. It was a very accurate shot you made. You didn't even have time to aim. I can see why men brag about your rifle shooting. I don't wish to boast about the exploit. It was slaying a human, although he was a savage. Is this the first warrior you've ever killed? Yes. I have fought with most of the creatures of the forest, such as bears, wolves, and catamounts. But this is the beginning with the redskins. Why didn't you take the scalp? That's always done, I'm told. No hand of mine will ever molest a scalp. If I was an Indian, I might, and then brag about it. But I'm white, and my vouchers are white. All white men don't think that way. Oh, yes, I know. But then there are miscreants of every color. And evil practices by a few will not make an act right. Keep your eyes open, Judith, for the other canoe. We'll turn this one loose. The wind is blowing toward the castle now, and it'll be safe. That is light, and we can look after it. I see the other one now, dear Slayer. Look. Just up the lake there, and drifting slowly into shore. I see it. Let me help you with the paddle. Ah, it isn't moving with the natural current of the wind, though. 
I can't account for that. Did you leave a paddle in it? No. All the paddles except the ones we are using are at the ark. I took them with me when we found the boats last night and set them adrift. Why? I'm sure there's something in motion on the other side of that canoe. I believe you're right. What can it be? I have it, gal. There's an engine in that boat. He's lying in it and paddling toward the shore with his arm. We must overtake him before he gets into land. Be careful, dear Slayer. He may be armed. Not likely, gal. He swam to the boat while we were just occupied and is trying to get it back in this method. He's heard us. Look, he's on his knees now. Take your rifle. I won't need it. Here, Redskin. If you've enjoyed yourself enough in that canoe, take to the lake again. I don't crave your blood. Take to the lake again before we get to hot words. <laughs> I thought as much. He's off to the shore, Judith. But he'll have his rifle in a few minutes. Here, take a hold of his canoe and I'll put us beyond his rifle. We've got the boats now and we'll join Hetty at the castle. Well, here we are, Hetty. We have all the canoes at the ark now, and we're safe for the present. Did you see anything of Father? No, we have no chance for that. Do you suppose he and Harry will find a way of escape? It isn't likely, Hetty. But when Chingakook comes tonight, we'll make some plans for their release. Well, what can two men do against a whole band of Indians on the warpath? I'll go ashore and tell him to let Father and Harry go. The Indians may do you no harm, Hetty, but they'll hardly listen to any such proposal as that. Uh, tell me something about your father, Judith. Harry Harry tells me he was once a sailor. If Harry knows anything of Father's history, I wish he'd told it to me. Sometimes I think he was a sailor, and sometimes I think not. Has he nothing among his belongings that would tell about his past? I've never seen anything. But if that chest of his was open... Or could speak, we could find out something, I'm sure. A chest? Yes, he has a large chest in his room, fastened with heavy iron bars and three locks. Did you ever see the chest open, Jude? No, never. Father never opens it in my presence, if he ever opens it at all. No one here has ever seen its lid raised. You're wrong, Jude. Father has raised the lid, and I've seen him do it. When and where did you ever see that chest open, Hetty? Here, and many times. Father opens it when you're awake. He doesn't mind my being near and hearing what he says and watching what he does. Well, what is it he does and what is it he says? Well, that I can't tell you, Judith. Father's secrets are not my secrets. This is strange, dear Slayer, that father should tell them to Hetty and not tell them to me. There's good reason for that, Judith, though you're not to know it. Father's not here to answer for himself, and I'll say no more about it. Can I see the chest, Judith? It's right next to us here in father's room. It's fastened, though. And he keeps the key hidden. You mustn't disturb it, Judith. You mustn't. Father's in danger. He may never come back. And the chest may give us information that will tell us more about who we are. It may have something that we could use for ransom. No, no. I tell you, Father wouldn't want you to open it. It'll do us no good. Don't, Judith. Leave it alone, please. Here's the box, dear Slayer. It's fastened with this padlock and these iron plates. Do you know where he keeps the key, Hattie? He's never shown me that. I think he keeps it with him. Please, Judith, let's leave it alone. You'll be sorry. Let's look for the key, dear Slayer. It's probably hidden somewhere in this room because Father wouldn't run the risk of carrying it. He knows it would be safer here. You look along that wall and I'll look over here under these clothes. Hetty's just superstitious. Did your father ever give any downright command concerning this chest, Judith? No. He's always appeared to think that its lock and steel bands are its best protection. Mm, it is a rare chest, anyway. Why, this wood comes from no forest I know of. The chest itself would buy your father's ransom. He seems to prize what the box holds more than the box itself. Well, I don't like to pry into another man's affairs. But if the chest has articles for your father's freedom, it seems to me they would be wisely used in redeeming their owner's life. But it doesn't belong to you, dear Slayer, or to Judith. You have no right to molest it. When the lawful owner of a buck or a trap or a canoe isn't present, his next of kin becomes his representative by all the laws of the woods, Hetty. Being the oldest, Judith, you have the right to say, in my opinion... When my father's life is in danger, I can't hesitate. I say we'll open it if we find the key. I've been looking for it here on this wall. You take a look for it in those drawers over there, dear Slayer. Don't stand there staring at us, Hetty. Help us search. I'll not help and I hope you don't find the key. It's sinful, but it's for Father's sake. You love him, don't you? More than you, Judith Hatter. I love him so much I'll not disobey him. I know he'd not have you do this. 
Well, the key's not here, dear Slayer. Let's look in this room next, which belongs to me and Hetty. I won't stay with you. And I tell you again, you'll be sorry if you do this evil thing. You'll be sorry. Uh, so this room belongs to you and Hetty? Yes. It would not be hard to tell which side belongs to you, gal. You love finery, they say. And I guess these handsome garments don't belong to the meek and lowly Hetty Hutter. Oh, that's just another evidence of Hetty's weak mind. That she thinks fine clothes are frivolous and sinful. Oh, don't waste any time looking among her things, dear Slayer. Nothing we seek would likely be found there. Your father trusts her, as she said. I reckon it'd be the most narrow thing for him to hide the key among her clothes. If it's in this room at all. Uh, look in that coarse pocket there. Dear Slayer, it's a key. It's the one, I'm sure. Come, quickly. It is the key. Oh, oh there. Oh, dear Slayer. Perhaps Hattie's is right. Maybe we should find some other means of releasing Father and hurry. Not so, gal. No means are as easy and certain as a good bribe. The little open, all right. It's loaded with iron and held by its own weight. Here, let me try it. Ah, here's a full cargo. Bring some stools while I open this blanket on the floor and we'll begin our work orderly and in comfort. Well, the first thing looks like a king's garment. A man's coat. Oh, what beautiful ornaments. All red and gold. Is it a military coat? It's like none I ever saw, though it may be. But it's an extraordinary thing. I think this will do, Judith. No Indian heart could withstand colors and glitter like this. If this coat was ever made for your father, you've come honestly by your taste for finery. That coat was never made for father. It's much too long. Father's short and square. <laughs> Cloth was plenty if it was, and glitter cheap. I should like to see it on your shoulders, dear Slayer. What? See me in a coat fit for a lord? If you wait till that day, Judith, you'll wait until you see me beyond reason and memory. No, no, gal. My gifts are my gifts, and I'll live and die in them. Though I'd never bring down another deer. What have I done that you wish to see me in such a flaunting coat? <laughs> because I think the false tongued young gallants at the garrison ought not, not to be the only ones to appear in fine feathers. I think truth and honesty should be honored. What honor to me to be bedizened and bescotted like a mingo? No, I'm well as I am. Uh, lay the coat on the blanket and we'll look further in the chest. Uh, here's something for you. Oh, oh, a dress. A brocade. Oh, how beautiful. Look, dear Slayer. It's just my size, too. Look. <laughs> I don't know a better way to treat with a mingo's gal than to send you ashore in that. And tell them a queen has arrived among them. Oh, I thought your tongue too honest to flatter. I've respected you because I thought you truthful. Tis solemn truth, Judith. Never did eyes of mine gaze on such a glorious creature as you, standing there with that dress falling from your shoulders. Well, of what use could a dress like this be to an Indian woman? She couldn't wear it among the branches of the trees. I think this is all we'll need now to trade with the Redskins. Uh, maybe we shouldn't explore further in the chest. But we might find something even more valuable to trade for ransom. Let's take everything out. Look! Pistols! Inlaid with silver. Did you ever see arms like these, dear Slayer? I saw an officer at the fort once who had just come from Europe who carried a pair like them. Here, let me see them, gal. Are they loaded? Uh, the white men are careless in putting away firearms in chests and corners. Let me open the pan and see... Yes, it's filled with priming, but it's been here so long, it's caked like a bit of cinder. Ah, but this gun's a handsome thing to look at, though. Child guns, the Delawares call these pistols. I can tell by your eyes, dear Slayer, that you'd like to be trying them. I can see that they're a challenge to your marksmanship. Is it safe to fire a pistol that's been loaded so long? It's very neglectful to leave a piece loaded so long. It takes fresh priming to ensure a proper discharge. Well, there's scarce a season goes by, but someone in the settlements don't suffer from one of these forgotten charges. What do you mean? Why, the pistol hangs fire as it's tarmed. And I have known weapons to break into fragments when, uh...
You are about to hear another episode of The Deer Slayer, dramatized and directed by Charles Frederick Lindsley. Slayer and Judith Hutter have been successful in their search for the lost canoes and have brought them back to the castle, although they encountered dangerous and thrilling experiences in effecting their rescue from the Indians. They are now at the log house in the middle of the lake, where they are discussing methods of obtaining the release of old Tom Hutter and Harry Harry March, who have fallen into Iroquois hands. Judith tells Deerslayer of an old chest that belongs to her father and they decide to open it and discover, if possible, the means of paying a ransom. The chest is locked, and Hetty alone knows where to find the key. She refuses to help him, saying that it is against her father's wishes, and that some danger lurks within, and they will be sorry if they proceed any further. However, they pay no attention to her, find the key, open the chest, and begin to explore its contents. They find some richly embroidered clothes and a pair of silver-mounted pistols. Deerslayer is handling one of these weapons when the air is torn with a violent explosion and they hear Hetty scream in terror. Hetty, what's wrong? Are you okay? Oh, Judy, I told you not to open that chest. What was that shot? Where's Deerslayer? Oh, I know something dreadful has happened. We found a pair of old silver pistols, and Deerslayer fired one by accident. But we're both safe. It's all over. It's all over. But it was a narrow escape. The plyman was old and caked, and the pistol burst into a hundred pieces when I was careless enough to let the hammer fall. But no harm was done. It seems miraculous that a pistol should burst in your hand and you escape without serious accidents. Such wonders aren't uncommon at all among worn-out arms. The first rifle they ever gave me played the same trick. Uh, Thomas Hutter is master of one pistol less than he was yesterday. But as it happened in trying to serve him, there's no ground for complaint, I guess. We've done right in opening the chest, have we? Because we've found enough already to offer a dozen ransoms for Father. And we're not to the bottom yet. Oh, come with us this time. The mischief's done and you've had no part in it. Oh, that's right. Come see the lovely dress we found. I have seen it. Sit down here and watch. We're almost through. What's the next article, dear Slayer? Uh, I don't know what it is, gal. Some unusual instrument, all done up with brass ornaments. It looks like the surveyor's tools I've seen. No, I, I've i seen all their implements. But none of them look like this. Was your father ever a surveyor, Judith? No, he's no surveyor, dear Slayer. That instrument goes far beyond his learning. Then he's fallen heir to another man's goods. Ah, what have we here in this bag? This is something new to my eyes. Little pieces of ivory. Heads of men. Knights on horses. And little castles on elephants. Judith, did your parents ever talk to you of religion? My mother did often. My father never. That I can believe. That I can believe. He has no god. No such god as it becomes a white man to worship or even a redskin. Them things are idols. Oh, dear Slayer, do you really think these ivory toys are father's gods? Yes, them are idols. Why should your father keep them if he doesn't worship them? Would he keep his gods in a bag and locked up in a closet? No, no. My father carries his gods with him wherever he goes, and that's in his own cravings. I think these came from some distant country and fell into his hands when he was a sailor. I'm downright glad to hear it, Judith. But I don't think I could keep a white idolater out of his difficulties. What do you call this? Uh, uh, an elephant? Yes, it's an elephant. I've often seen pictures of such animals at the garrison. And Mother had a book in which there was a printed account of the creatures. Well, elephant or no elephant, tis an idol. 
and not fit to remain in Christian keep. Oh, they may not be idols, dear Slayer. Oh, I know. I remember I've seen one of the officers at the garrison with a set of fox and geese made in this same design. They use them in playing some kind of game. What's this, wrapped in cotton? Maybe it belongs to your idols. Now, let me see. Uh, it's a board with a piece of ivory built into it. I think... Uh... Now I'm sure that these queer figures belong to a game of some sort. Uh, I'm not convinced, Judith. But of one thing I'm certain, one of these uh, elephants, as you call them, would buy a whole tribe of Iroquois. Uh, you need have no fear for your father now. His ransom is settled. Well, when can we visit the tribe and make an exchange? Tonight at sunset, we'll meet my friend, the Delaware chief, at the Big Rock, as we agreed. He'll advise us how we should best make offers to our enemies. Uh, I feel the need of sleep, gal. But half an hour before sunset, we start in the ark to keep the rendezvous with our friend. You keep a lookout on the lake. And call me if you see any sign of our enemies having taken to the water. your friend now. I'm ready, Judith. I've decided, gal, to go alone in one of the canoes. It'll be a hazardous journey, and you shouldn't risk your life in the venture. I've been thinking too, my friend, and I think you should take the ark, because it's quite safe from the enemy's rifles. And in that case, I'll go along, because I know how to use firearms, and I can be of service if you're attacked. You can do the rowing, and I'll stand guard when your friend Chingakook makes his jump from the rock to the boat. What about Hetty? Oh, I've discussed the matter with her, and she insists on staying here at the castle. She's been very sullen all day because we insisted on opening that chest. She seems to be making some plan of her own, but I can't tell what it is. But the varmints will see us when we leave here. And if they've been building a raft, they'll make an attempt to occupy this castle in our absence. Hetty will not be able to keep them out. Oh, she can lock herself up here. Anyway, as I've explained to you, the Indians believe that Hetty is feeble-minded, as she is, poor child. They'll not harm her. In fact, she'll be safer here than with us on the ark. Well, it's time to leave, dear Slayer. Are you ready? I'm not convinced you're right, Judith. Though the cabin on the ark is built of good stout logs. And if we can rescue the chief, the two of us can stand off the enemy a long time, unless they swamp us before we get off the shore. I guess we'll try it. You bring the canoes inside the palisades and padlock them in, and I'll fasten these doors and windows. Judith, if your father was ever on the sea, it's likely that he has a spyglass around here. Uh, have you ever seen one? Oh, yes. We use it all the time. It's on those high brackets in the corner of his room. I'll get it. Dear Slayer. Hello, Hetty. Are you over your fright now? Dear Slayer. Do you think if I went ashore and told the Indians it was unchristian to hold father, they'd let him go? No, Hetty. The Redskins can understand such doctrines. You stay here with the castle until we bring off my friend. And tomorrow we'll try to bring them to their senses with the ransom things we found in the chest. Do you see this little book, dear Slayer? It's a Bible. It belonged to Mother. She taught me to read it. I'll take this to the Indians and tell them that there's a God who rules over the whole earth and is a ruler of all men, red or white. Oh, I understand a little now what they mean who have told me about your reasoning powers, Gal. I've seen too much of these natives in my life to know the reception of that kind of preaching. I've often gone among the Indians, dear Slayer, and have preached to them, too. They never harmed me. They were not on the warpath then, or it would have been different. I know they'll not harm you yourself, but they won't listen to anything you can say about releasing their captives. No, you leave that to me and Chingakook. Here's the spyglass, dear Slayer. Well, does Hetty still insist on staying here? I'll stay here. I've much to think about, and I can't help you on the water. Judith and I will cast off then in the ark, Hetty. You'd better keep a lookout through these little windows that look so much like portholes. If all holds well, we should be back an hour after dark.
Keep your glass on the shore, gal. They're probably preparing a raft. Can you see anything? No, dear Slayer. I've studied the shore inch by inch, and I see nothing yet. Well, why are you hitting the scow in all manner of directions? I'm trying to baffle the bombers. They're no doubt watching us, but I'll make them leg weary tramping after us. And at the last minute, I'll swing back to the rock. Well, must we reach the rock exactly at the moment the sun sets? Precisely. Well, a few moments sooner or later won't matter, though, will it? Yes, it will. The rock's within pine flank distance for a gun. It won't do to hover too close or too long. Do you see any sign of the enemy yet? No, everything is quiet. I can't see a motion. But it's getting gloomy along the banks now, and we're not far from the rock. Why are you heading east again? The rock is almost due south. As I told you, to get the savages tramping off in the wrong direction. You really think they're watching our movement? Certainly. Oh, I was in hopes they'd fallen back into the woods and left us to ourselves for a few hours. That's altogether a woman's conceit. There's no let up in an engine's watchfulness when he's on the warpath. His eyes are on us this minute. Our only hope is to get them off on a wrong scent. The Mingos have good noses, but a white man's reason ought to equalize their instinct. Now we'll head in. Keep your eyes alert. Oh, I like the way you make decisions, dear Slayer. You make me confident that we'll succeed. Was your father ever in the hands of the Iroquois before? Yes, once, but a few skins easily released him. Well, it won't be so easy this time. I'll take the sail down now and we'll float in close. Stand at the loophole there on the, on the side next to the shore. And give me warning if anyone approaches. We must be close in now, Judith. Can you see the rock? Yes. Is it empty? Can you see the Delaware chief yet? No, dear Slayer. Neither rock, shore, nor trees seem to have ever held a human being. Keep close, Judith. Keep close. A rifle has a prying eye, a nimble foot, and a desperate fatal tongue. Keep close, but be on the alert. And you, dear Slayer, do you keep close? Don't let the savages get a glimpse of you. A bullet would be as fatal to you as to me. No fear of me, gal. No fear of me. Don't look this way. Keep your eyes on the rock. <coughs> what is it? What is it, Judith? There's a man on the rock. An Indian warrior in his paint and armed. Where does he wear his hawk's feather? Is it fast to the warlock? Or does he carry it above the left ear? Above the left ear. He smiles, too, and mutters the word, Mohican. God be praised to the serpent at last. He's getting ready to jump in the ark, dear Slayer. Here he comes. Huh? Serpent, come. Dear Slayer, on time. Welcome, serpent. You're here in the nick of time. <laughs> Pull, dear Slayer. Pull for life and death. The lake is full of savages waiting after us. Help me get this craft underway, Chief. Once in motion, we can fight off an army. Fall, oh, dear Slayer. For heaven's sake. They're swimming to the ark. They're coming after us. They'll seize the ark. about to hear another episode of The Deer Slayer, dramatized and directed by Charles Frederick Lindsley. to meet his friend, a Delaware chief named Chingakook, at the shore of the lake at sunset. He and Judith in the ark leave the castle and proceed to the appointed place. They are conscious or are watching their movements. Erslayer tries to throw them off the track of the ark in different direction. At last, swings the barge into shore. Chingakook is waiting at the appointed moment from the rock to the boat when Judith screams, Pull, dear Slayer, for life and death. 
A little savage getting after us. The earth seizes the grapnel line. Dark blood. What now, Judith? And go still follow? No, they're tearing back to shore. They're just burying himself in... We're afraid of our rifles. We're on the lookout, gal. Or they'd have hauled us shoot. It would have been a hand-to-hand tussle with the odds against us. Will they make another attempt to reach us? Not now. Oh, we are armed. Judith, this tall, handsome young finger cook, which signified so-called cunning. Cheap story, and it'll take some time. Does he understand English, dear? And speaks it, too. The south is going to be another murky night. Keep our eyes on the shore. Aim out and size us. In a moment, from the south shore, to the castle under natural power. Starboard, I'll just happen to mutter, although there's little to say. On the with a young trapper named Hurley Harry. He was on his hutter, who lives with his two daughters in a court he used to build. When I came, the two men went for scalps and were captured by the enemy. I got off, though, and have been watching over the gals. We've brought off all the canoes that old Tom had hidden on the shore, and we're safe for the present, until the varmints have had time to build a raft with which to storm the castle, as Hutter calls his house. And uh, that's about all, I guess. And now it's our duty to plan a rescue before it's too late. Yes, Lair, the wind has come up now, and if you put up the sail, it'll not be necessary to row back to the castle. Very good, gal. <laughs> this rowing isn't much to a Delaware's liking anyway. It certainly turned out to be a gloomy night. I hope we have no trouble in finding the castle. Tell us about... Four days ago, Chingakook leave Delaware village. Half mile from Susquehanna, find trail. Iroquois trail. Follow here to lake. Half day, watch camp of Mingo. You've actually been to the camp of the enemy? Can you tell us anything of their captives, my father and his friend, Hurry Harry? Chingakook see them. Old man, young warrior. Holding hemlock, tall pine. <laughs> You're not so much out, Delaware. Old Hutter is decaying of a certainty. As for Hurry Harry, so far as height and strength go, he might be called the pride of the forest. Were the men bound or in any way suffering torture? Not so. Mingo, busy. Some watch, some sleep. Some scout, some hunt. Today, pale face treated like brother. Tomorrow, lose scalp. Oh, I'm glad they're not suffering. By tomorrow, we may be able to do something for them. Are there women with the Mingos, Chingakook? Squaw in camp. Then I have articles of dress that will suit their eyes. And we found many things today that will please the men. How is it, Sarpent, that there are squaws among the knaves? How many women are there? Sarpent see six and what to walk. That's his sweetheart, Judith. Did you see her, Chief? Did you come close to her? No, dear Slayer. Three too many. Leave too many. But Chingakook heard laugh of Watawa. Different from laugh Iroquois women. Watawa laugh like Ren. <laughs> Trust a lover's ear for that. I know not why it's... I've seen grim warriors listening to the chattering and laughing of young girls as if it was church music. Have you never felt how pleasant it is to listen to the laugh of a sweetheart? Why, Lord bless you, gal. I've never lived enough along my own color to drop into them sort of feelings. To me, there's no music as sweet as the wind in the treetops, the rippling of a stream, or the mouth of a sartin hound when I'm on the track of a buck. Then I think you have much to learn. Ace Hunter met Mingo in fight since coming too late? Yes, I have fell in with the enemy, and I suppose it may be said I've fought him, too. Huh? Any scalp? I maintain that's again white gifts. Did no warrior fall? Deer slayer not slow with rifle. Yes, I don't boast, but I may say one Mingo fell. Huh. Chief? That's more than I know or can say. He was artful and treacherous, and he fought well. But he wasn't quick enough. My brother and friend struck the body? That was uncalled. Seeing the Mingo died in my arms. But I fought with the gifts of my own color. I did not take his scalp. Deer slayer pale face. Has pain and heart. Delaware will look for scalp. Hang on pole. Sing song to our people. Now, that's easy telling, Chingakook. But will not be easy to do. The Mingo's body is in the hands of his friends. And is no doubt hid in some hole. Where Delaware cunning will never be able to get at the scalp. Listen, dear Slayer. Do you hear anything? No. It seems as if the water was stirring near us. Sovereign here. Something move in water. It might be a fish. Fish prey on each other like men and animals on land. There it is again. Do hear something. Listen. 
You're right, gal. It sounds like a paddle. Take your rifle, Chinkakook. Whoever it is, they're moving with caution. I see it now. It is a canoe. And there's someone standing in it paddling. But there may be others concealed in the bottom. We can't beat them by flight. A flat boat would be no match with a bark canoe. Hand me my rifle, Judith. Quick, dear Slayer. You can easily bring down the paddler and take them by surprise. Oh, I could, yes. But give him a chance is my motto. I'll hail him first and ask his errand. Stop. If you come nearer, I'll fire. Sergeant Death will follow. Stop paddling and answer. Fire and kill a defenseless girl. Katie. And God will never forgive you. Go your way, dear Slayer, and let me go mine. Don't try to stop me. Do you hear me? We must stop her, dear Slayer. You, you don't know what she has in her mind. We can't compete with the canoe, Judith. If she's bound to take her course, we'll have to let her. But what can this mean, gal? Why has your sister taken one of the canoes from the ark and headed shoreward with it? You know she's feeble-minded, dear Slayer, but she has her own ideas of what ought to be done. She loves her father more than most children love their parents. Your sister is now bent on some mad scheme to serve her father? Why, the gal will give the Mingos the mastership of a canoe. Such, I fear, is true, friend. Poor Hetty has hardly enough cunning to outwit a savage. We must stop her if we can. Or at least retrieve the canoe. Grab this oar, Delaware. You go to the head of the scow, Judith, and keep a lookout. We may overtake her. Unless she knows the shortest line to the shore. Pull, Chingakook. Straight ahead. No, she turned sharply to the right. Back, water, Chief, while I pull us around. All right. Straight ahead again. We'll make it if the gal don't change her path too often. Oh, now she's just turned back to the left again. Now the gal has more sense than they claim for her. If she doubles once more, we'll lose sight of her. Stop this, Leah. I've lost sight of the canoe. Stop. I don't know which direction to tell you now. Well, the shadows on the water here are awfully black. Stop rowing, Chief. Uh, I guess the feeble-minded one that they call her has given us the slip. Come ahead here and lend me your eagle eyes. Maybe we can see more than Judith. She disappeared over there to the left when she last changed her course. Do you hear her paddle, Chinkakook? No, hear paddle. All still. In what direction is the Iroquois camp, dear Slayer? It's west and a little south, I think. Why? I have a plan. We'll move down near it and wait. I think it likely that Hetty will make her way there when she thinks she's no longer followed. She may. Then again, she may land anywhere on the shore and go on foot to the enemy's camp. Uh, the gal has more caution than we give her credit for. If she doesn't have reason, she has instinct, which is sometimes even more valuable in the woods. Well, if she does have instinct, as you say, she may set the canoe adrift after she lands, because she's seen Father do that often. If she does that, we can find it in the morning with the glass and take it back to the castle. But it will leave your sister in jeopardy. But the Iroquois will not harm her. She knows that. Ah, uh, when the varmints are on the warpath and after white scalps, they may think differently. Take a cook. Lay her head more into the shore. But keep the mast clear of the trees. Sure, very close, dear Slayer. Tree not far away. Don't get them embayed, Chief. Yes, sir, there's the canoe. Hattie, Hattie. Keep the skull straight, Del Delaware. Straight as a boat flies. If it's empty, we'll pick it up. Hattie, are you there? Oh, I believe it's empty, dear Slayer. Poor girl's gone ashore and set the canoe adrift as I saw. You're right, Judith. It is empty. Slow up, Chingakook. While I fasten it to the ark. Hattie. Hattie, are you within hearing? Oh, for God's sake, answer me. I'm here on the shore, Judy. It'll be useless to follow me. I'll hide in the woods. Oh, Hattie, what are you doing? It's near midnight, and the woods are filled with wild savages and wild beasts. Neither will harm a poor half-witted girl, Judy. God is as much with me here as he would be in the castle. I'm going to help poor father and hurry Harry. But you can't do anything for them. They'll be tortured unless someone cares for them. We all care for them, Hetty, and tomorrow we'll send a flag of truce. And by that reason, oh, please come back. We have better heads than you, and we'll do all we can for father. I know your head is better than mine, Judy, but I must go to father. You and dear Slayer go back to the castle and leave me in the hands of God. God is with us all, sister. You can do nothing in the dark. You will lose your way in the forest. God will not let that happen to one who goes to help her father. I must try to find the savages before it's too late. Come back for the night only, please. In the morning, we'll put you ashore and let you do as you think right. You say so, Judy. You say so now, but in the morning, your heart would soften, and you'd see Tommy hawks and scalping knives in the air. I've got a thing to tell the Indian chief. And you'll see, 
He'll let Father go as soon as he hears it. Oh, Hetty, what can you say to a bloody savage that will change his purpose? That which will frighten him and make him let Father go. You'll see. Will you tell me, Hetty, what you mean to say? I know the Indians well and can judge how your idea will work with the Redskins. I can't tell you, dear Slayer, but I will go to the chief and when he hears me, you will see too. He will send hurry father and me to the shore opposite to the castle and tell us to go in peace. You'll see. You'll see. about to hear another episode of The Deer Slayer, dramatized and directed by Charles Frederick Lindsley. Slayer and Judith go in the ark to meet the Delaware chief, Chingakook. They rescue the young warrior, although nearly overhauled by Indians hiding in ambush. On the return to the castle, they hear the sound of a canoe paddle. Deer Slayer orders the occupant of the canoe to stop and is answered by the voice of Hetty Hutter, whom they had left at the castle, but who now is on her way to the shore to intercede with the Mingos for the release of her father and hurry Harry. She eludes Deer Slayer and reaches the shore. Calling back, she will not return until she has seen the Mingo chief. After a night in the woods, Hetty starts to the camp of the enemy and is met on the way by a young Indian girl who smiles at her and greets her with friendly face. Where go? Indian, red man, savage, wicked warrior, that away. Good warrior, far off. Who are you? What's your name? Me? Watawa. I know Mingo, English. Come here till you come for. Where do you come, father, and say scalps? He's right. Why he is me by hair and try to... Who did he see? No, 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 tell different for pale face to slay or always tell. Do you? He is now in the ark with the glass nothing at the rock. Unless they... Chingo, come here. Diva, Chingo, cook, red warrior. God will not part. True, I tell you. For your battle. Never given. Leave. I thought mount you home. What the what the war friend? I've a sis by home. Or of scant different color. When they spell the maid, tell her what you do in me. Home together. I'm Lizer. Love you looking. I do you himself. A warrior must take one. Never want to marry me. I'm not other often tell him time. Not half you love different with you. There's no reason why the serpent should not marry you. Shh. He's the prisoner. Mingo got big ear. No speak Chingo Cook when they buy. Promise he I know. Dear Slayer and the Serpent mean to get you away from the Iroquois. And you wish me not to tell a secret. When Mingo close, old tongue, never talk. Good Hetty must not tell secret of friend. I promise his not to mention Chinga Cook's name. Maybe he get off hurry and father as well as his. If let him have his way, think of that, Hetty, and put twenty finger on mouth. No get friends free without stopping to do it. Come, I take you to Mingo camp. Can these Mingos speak English here? 
Not much. Understand some. Me. But what hands about an attack on field raft, maybe? The Bible says about oh, your father. These are fierce heroes. Hey. I say you should not have come mentioned. Maybe you. In a peace time to take scalp. To the... They fell on him like an av. On you, fear not. Back you will be here. Who I am and brought me here. Seen to Iroquois. Even who? That is my father. Why come to burn his friends? Uh, they did. The you good book. Why, great spirit, no. Why well, read? Oh, let me tell you what this book says. I will read it to you. First, you are commanded to love thy neighbor as thyself. Neighbor for Indian, no mean pale face. Neighbor mean Iroquois for Iroquois, Mohican for Mohican. Pale face for pale face. No need tell chief anything else. You forget these are the words of the great spirit. Whoever shall smite thee on thy right cheek, turn to him the other also. Well, what that means? It means that if white men try to hurt you, you should not hurt them in return. Or if white men try to take red man's scalp, Indian must not take white man's scalp. And listen to this. Love your enemies. Bless them that curse you. Do good to them that hate you. This is good book of paleface? Yes. White man live by this book? They all try. The French, the Canadas, and the Yankees. Paleface friend, listen. This is paleface law. It tell him be good to them that hurt him. When his brother asked him for a rifle, he told to give powder horn too. Ah, pale face law. Not so, not so. There is not a word about rifles in the whole book. And powder and bullets give offense to the great spirit. Why then does pale face use them? Why he take double from poor Indian who ask for no thing? He come from beyond rising sun with book in hand. Teach red man to read it. Why pale face forget all it say to him? White man offer gold for scalp of our women and children and call Indian beast if he takes scalp of warrior killed in battle. One time white face say white, other time he say black. But it matters not what the wicked do. The words of the great spirit are the words of the great spirit. Render good for evil, says this book, and that is the law for red men as well as for white. Ah, no good tell chief such law as that. Tell something he believe. Tell me, what are you going to do with father in hurry? He'll face die tonight. Sunset. Oh, no, you can't be so cruel. He'll face die tonight. Sunset. If you do, dear Slayer will kill you. Oh, I know all about dear Slayer and friend Delaware Chief. They do no good. Tonight, Iroquois, go on big raft and burn Muskrat Castle. Pale face sister will become Iroquois squaw. <laughs> About to hear another episode of The Deer Slayer, dramatized and directed by Charles Frederick Lindsley.
Hetty Hutter's mission to the Iroquois camp seems to have failed in its purpose to free her father and hurry Harry. She reads from her Bible to Rivenoak, the chief, but he is unimpressed. When the girl asks what he intends to do with his captives, he replies sullenly that they must die at sunset. And he also tells her that the Indians have built a raft and intend to attack and burn Muskrat Castle, where Deerslayer, Chingakook, and Judith are holding a council of war. The present episode opens at the castle, where the three friends are facing a serious prospect. It is just after sunrise, and Deerslayer has gone to arouse the Delaware chief. I've brought you some white man's clothes, chief. Here, put them on. No need, Deerslayer. Iroquois not know Chingukuk on lake. But you can't remain concealed for long. It's again all prudence to be seen in your war dress and paint. Wash off all them fiery streaks from your cheeks. And put these garments on. And this hat. White man's clothes no good for Delaware chief. Listen, Chingakook. If the Mingos know you are here, Watawa will be in more danger. It's best to make the varmints on shore think that two white men are in the castle. Hmm. I change. Judith has some breakfast ready for us in the main cabin. Come in when you get civilized. Did you find it hard to persuade him, dear Slayer? He's a Delaware born, Judith. But when I used Walter War as an argument, he came around. He seems very fond of his Delaware girl. Is she pretty, dear Slayer? The best looking maiden in the whole tribe. You should hear her voice and see her when she smiles. And do you say she was stolen by the Iroquois? Just plain kidnap when she was away with her father and mother on a fishing trip. Do the Indians love their children? The red man has the same feelings we do. Yes, they love their children. And Chingakook loves his gal. That's why he's come to rescue her. Oh, this whole business is horrible. We must do something at once. Hetty will have no influence. She thought her Bible would convert the enemy, but she's probably a prisoner herself by this time. Did you tell your Delaware friend about the chest and the things we found? Uh, not yet. But I have some of these elephant things in my pocket... And I'll show them to him when he comes. Well, here he is. <laughs> well, Chingakook, the Mingos won't recognize you in that garb. Why, you look civilized as a Christian. My face is almost as brown as yours, and we could both pass as white men at a long distance. Yeah, sit down and eat while we make plans. Tell him about the chest, Judith. We've been trying to find things to buy Father's ransom, and we opened an old chest that he's always kept secret. We found some wonderful clothes embroidered with gold and lace, some handsome dresses, a pair of silver pistols, and some ivory elephants. I have some of them here, Chief. Take a look. I call them idols. Mm. Look uh, at his eyes, Judith. Uh, Did you ever see Indian greed before? Uh, I told you. Uh, good. Good. White animals buy a whole tribe of Iroquois. Yes, Leah. I hear steps on the platform outside. Someone is coming. Keep back. Let me see through the chink here. It's a mingo, Judith. I do believe the varmints have come off on a raft. Give me my rifle and keep in the corner. Chingakook, go in the next room. You mustn't be seen yet. It is an Indian, but Hetty's is with him. Judy, dear player, don't be afraid. We're alone. We have no arms. We have a message from the Iroquois. Open the door, Judith, while I keep the savage covered. Don't fire, dear player. Not armed, I tell you. Come in, Indian, and sit down. Hetty, are you safe? Tell us, did you go to the enemy camp? Did you see Father? What did the chief say? Yes, I saw Father. I did not stay with him long, though. I went at once to the chief, Rivenook. I read him texts from my Bible. What did he say? At first, he said Father and Hurry were to be killed at sunset. Then he came later and said he was wrong, that what I had read from the good book was right. Then he put me on a raft and sent me with the Indian to the castle. Didn't I tell you, Judy, about the power of the Bible? If it were true, it would be a miracle. Let me talk a little with Hetty. Was this raft made after you reached the Indian camp, gal? Or was it ready-made? The raft was ready-made and in the water. Could that have been a miracle? Yes, an Indian miracle. You found the raft ready-made and waiting for its cargo, huh? It was as you say. The raft had been built. They put me on it and told this young man to roll me off here. And the woods is full of the vagabonds waiting to know what's to be the upshot of the miracle. No, I comprehend the affair now. But let me keep my eyes on this young bloodsucker or he'll borrow a canoe without asking. Uh-huh, I see he has his eye on them elephants. He's been too busy studying them to notice much else since arriving here. Listen, Mingo. Forget them white elephants for a minute. I want to talk to you. 
Where t'other, pale brother? He sleeps. How did you know there was another? See him from shore. Iroquois got long eye. See beyond cloud. See bottom great spring. Can you tell me, boy, what your chief intends to do with their prisoners? Scalp. When? Tonight. Sunset. Why not take them to your wigwams? Wigwam full. Scalp sell high. Small scalp, much gold. That explains it. Now look here, lad. Those white men belong in this castle. See them white animals you've been admiring? You go back to your chief and say we will give him two of the ivory creatures as ransom. One for each scalp. Go back and tell him this, and bring me the answer before sunset. White man let Injun take one animal? Show, chief? No, your chief would never see it. You can tell him all about it. Now get out. But bring me the answer before sunset. Iroquois chief will come out to bargain with you, Deerslayer? No doubt of it. Did you see that young Indian's eyes glitter as he looked at those ivory elephants? Uh, the tale he'll tell to old Riven Oak will bring him out all right. You've been watching the show now for a long time. Do you see any sign of their leaving? Not yet, but I expect you any time now. Hetty, uh, Chingakook here is very anxious to get some information from you. He's not much of a talker. But I'm going out onto the platform with this spyglass and leave him alone with you. Tell him about his sweetheart. I'll call when the Redskins put out from the shore. Your name is Chingakook? Chingakook? You are the great serpent of the Delaware? Chingakook? That say great serpent. Deer slayer tongue. Chingakook. That's what Hist called it. Hist? You mean Watawa? Watawa or Histo Hist. I think Hist is prettier than Wa, so I call her Hist. Wah, very sweet in Delaware ears. She sing like bird. You hear her sing? I did. What she sing most? How she look? Often she laugh? She sang Chingakook oftener than anything else. You, you have a message from her, Delaware. I'll tell it to you. I hope these logs haven't ears. Hiss told me to say this. You mustn't trust the Iroquois. Then she says, there is a large bright star that comes over the hill about an hour after dark. And just as that star comes in sight, she will be on the point where I landed last night. And this, you must come for her in a canoe. Good. Chingakook, understand. And now let me tell you something for myself. When you marry Hist, you must be kind to her and smile on her. And not be cross as some of the chiefs are with their squaws. Always good to walk. Too tender to twist hard. Else she break. Go to Deerslayer now. Shh. Deerslayer, come. Here a boy have put off from the shore, chief. I want you to help me watch him. There's no telling what devilry they're up to. Well, did you hear from Watawa? Wa meet me tonight when star come over hill. You help me rescue? That's what I came here for. This battle for Hutter is just an accident. Maybe I go myself. Give me strange beasts. Me take canoe. Yes, Slayer. The Iroquois are getting close. All right, gal. I don't like your plan, Delaware. Canoe you shan't have. Why put your forces in the enemy's hands before the battle's fought? But we'll talk more about this later. Let's tend to the business in hand. Come out and tell me what you think of the raft. I've been trying to see, dear Slayer, if they have any firearms. Well, I couldn't find any, but they might have some hidden... In the hemlock brush they've laid across the logs. Anyway, there are only two of the enemy. They can't hurt us. Don't you think they should stop now? We can talk from here. Yes, you're right. All right, Mingos. Stop where you are. Are you chiefs? Or have the Mingos sent me warriors without names on this errand? Oh, uh, my name Rivenoak. Iroquois, chief. What's your errand? Why do you come on logs that are not even dug out? Iroquois, no duck to walk on water. What pale face name? One of your warriors who started for the happy hunting grounds yesterday morning gave me the name of Hawkeye because my sight happened to be quicker than his. My brother Hawkeye, he sent message to Hurons. Say he has beast with two tails. Show them to Rivenoak. Very well. Here, I'll toss you one. 
If it's not returned, this rifle will settle the point between us. Catch! <laughs> Do you think he'll return it, dear Slayer? Look at them and stare at it. They think it's an animal with two tails. It passes beyond anything they ever saw in these woods. Well, what do you say, Rivenoak? Has my pale-faced brother any more such beasts? Yes, but one's enough to buy 50 scouts. One of my prisoner, great warrior, tall and pine, strong as moose, of the prisoner very wise. King of these lakes. I know. But a beast with two tails is worth two such scalps. But my brother has another beast. He will give two for old father. No. It's beyond all reason. One beast is enough. Huh? Rivenoak will not trade with pale face. Two scalps worth more than one beast. Here, take beast. We go back to shore. Oh, dear, sir. Tell him you'll give him two. We don't want them. They're going back. Quick, tell him two. Not yet, Judith. I think that when he has reconsidered, he will... Dear, sir, be on your guard. I can see rifles underneath the hemlock brush. And the other Iroquois is loosening them with his feet. about to hear another episode of The Deer Slayer, dramatized and directed by Charles Frederick Lindsley. has negotiated for the ransom of the two white men held prisoners by the Iroquois. He has shown the chief, Rivenoak, the curious little ivory elephants, the beasts with two tails, and demanded the return of Tom Hutter and Harry March for their exchange. Rivenoak parleys with the woodsman and finally refuses the offer. As the Iroquois push off in their raft, Judith, who is watching them through the spyglass, cries out a warning. Be on your guard, dear Slayer. I can see rifles beneath the hemlock brush, and the Iroquois is loosing them with his feet. I see what you're doing, Mingo. Make another move for them rifles, and you're a dead engine. Iroquois, no got rifles. You lie. I can see them with this spyglass. Oh, why should Rivenoak and White Brother leave cloud between them? They're both wise and brave. We part like friends. One beast, price, or one prisoner. I thought you'd come to your senses. And now, Mingo, you'll see that a pale face knows how to be generous. Bring us our friends and you can have three ivory beasts. And if you come before sunset, you may have a fourth. A pale face? He give tall animal with two tail if white captive men come before sunset? Yes, four. A Rivenu, chief of Iroquois. He go, captive, come. Dear Slayer, can any face be put in these wretches? Won't they keep the toy elephant they have and send us instead some bloody proof of their cunning? No doubt, Judith. If it wasn't for engine nature, but that two-tailed beast will turn the whole tribe into a hornet's nest of curiosity. There'll be no peace between them until they get every carved bone they can from us. Well, all we can do now is to wait and see what they will do. I wonder 
why they've been so long in coming. It's almost dark now. Do you suppose they've intentionally waited until this time so they can attack us? No, they'll not attack, I'm sure. They know the danger in that. I think they probably had Hurry and your father at a camp removed from the pint where they embarked and had to wait until some of the band could fetch him. Must not make Iroquois angry. Be friendly, dear Slayer. Well, that's a new note from you, Chingakook. What's your reason in that? Make Iroquois angry? They take women away from camp. Oh, I see. Some more kind of big serpent. Uh, he's afraid, Judith, that the engines will remove the women and children and take Watawa along. Now, I guess you're right, Chief. Rather than have the bargain fall through now, I'll throw in three or four war trinkets to please their fancy. We must keep them calm and trustful until we can get your gal away from them. I believe I see them now, dear Slayer. It's getting dark, but maybe you can tell who's on the raft. Why, you're right, gal. They've slipped up on us almost while we've been talking about them. Here, let me see. Can you see Father and Harry? Yes. Your father and Harry are on board, all right. All trussed up like animals. Listen. Ahoy there! Judith! Deerslayer! It's Father. It's all right, old Tom. Tell the Mingos to keep the distance. We'll make our bargain from here. Tinkerkook, go inside and hide all the firearms. I know Hurry Harry, and he'll break faith with the enemy as soon as he lands. If he can lay hand to a rifle. Are you armed, dear boy? No, pale face, brother, no. Ribbon will put faith in him. No got gun on rat. All right. Draw up and put your prisoners on this platform. But we have you covered in one false move and you'll never see your tribe again. Judith here will hand you the little beast when you help old Tom and his friend up on the castle. Here, Judith, take these elephants and pass them over when the prisoners come up on the platform with us. The other Iroquois cutting the ropes off their feet now and helping them up. Oh, they've been trussed up so tight they can hardly stand. Hello there, Harry. <laughs> you look like a girdled pine in the clearing. I'm glad to see that you haven't had your hair dressed by any Iroquois barbers. Okay, dear Slayer. It'll be prudent for you to deal less in mirth and more in friendship. Give us a hand. Act like a Christian for once and not like a laughing schoolgirl. We'll take the master of the castle first. Up with you, Hutter. Here, let me cut these bonds off your hands. You've come off whole, feet and all. You're just a little numb from being tied up so tight, that's all. Here, dance around a bit and nature will soon set the blood in motion. Have you delivered the elephants, Judith? Yes, River Oak has them all. Good. Come on, Harry, you're next. Welcome to Muskrat Castle. And I'll perform the same service for you. There. Give me the rifle. Hurry. I'll teach them bloody farmers they can't treat Hurry Hurry this way. Not that rifle, Hurry. Are you crazy? You're Stop me. it, I say. I'll tell you them Indians have treated me in a terrible way. You think I'm going to let them get away with it? Well, Hurry, it's a good thing that you fired straight in the air. If you had killed one of the Mingos on the raft, no ransom in the world could save our scalps. You're a fool to lose control of yourself in such a way. You've come off whole and that's not little. Knowing that there's four rifles on the castle now, the farmers may decide to leave these parts. Ah, you're a woman, dear Slayer. Grow a beard, and maybe you'll be fit company for real men. That black at Rivenoak has an uncommon scalp, and I'd give as much for it as the colony. A white man's word is worth more than all the scalps in the world, Hurry. And dear Slayer never breaks faith, even with a redskin. Well, it's over now, and sighs and lamentations won't mend the matter. Judith, darling, did you mourn for me much when I was in the hands of the enemy? Our tears have raised the lake, Harry March, as you might have seen by the shore. We grieve for Father, of course, but for you we fairly rain tears. Yeah. It's a wonderment to me how you got us off, dear Slayer. Let us into the secret. Was it by lying or by coaxing? By neither, Hurry, but by buying. We paid a ransom for you. But be on your guard again, lest our stock of goods shouldn't hold out. I wonder if it's peace or war betwixt us and the savages. This giving up captives has a friendly look. Here's an answer to that question, Master March. Look at that. Why, it's a bundle of sticks tied with a piece of deerskin. Where did it come from? Oh, look, Harry. The ends have been dipped in blood. You're right, Judith. If this isn't plain English, it's plain Indian. This is a declaration of war. How did you get this, Deerslayer? Where did it come from? We left Chingakook on the lookout after the Iroquois chief left on his raft. He tells me that the raft had not gone far until it headed toward us again. He was just about to call me when Rivenoak threw this faggot up on the platform of the castle and then rode away. The prowling wolves! Hand me that rifle, Judith. I'll send an answer back to the vagabond. Not while I stand by, Hurry. He'll do no good. Give me a rifle, I say. Yeah, give me a canoe, and I'll overhaul the devils and bring back Rivenoak's scalp. I'll attack their camp if necessary. They fetched me once, 
But this time, the pale and reptiles will not catch me up. Dear Slayer, you're untrue to your friend. Shame on you, Harry March. You're a braggart and an ingrate. Let him rant, Jude. The war's not over, Hurry. And you'll have chance enough to express your vengeance. But go into the cabin with Hutter and cool yourself off. You're in no danger tonight. Ah, you're nothing but a screw. You're a well-named young man, Judith. Harry certainly expresses his nature. And that quick temper of his will get him into plenty of trouble before he dies. Oh, dear Slayer, this is a terrible life for women. Would to heaven I could see an end to it. The life is well enough, Judith. What would you wish to see in its place? I should be a thousand times happier to live near us civilized beings, where sleep at night would be sweet and tranquil. A dwelling near the fort would be better than this dreary place. Nay, hey, Judith, I can't agree in the truth of all that. If forts are good to keep off enemies, they sometimes hold enemies of their own. But women are not made for scenes like these, dear Slayer. Scenes of which we shall have no end as long as this wall lasts. If you mean women of white color, you're not far from the truth. But it's different for the women of the red men. Nothing would make Hist happier than to know that Chingakook is prowling around for a scalp. Surely she cannot be a woman and not feel concern when she knows the man she loves is in danger. She doesn't think of the danger, Judith, but of honor. Well, no white girl could feel anything but misery if she believed her betrothed in danger of his life. Nor do I believe that even you could be at peace if you believed your Hist in danger. Uh, but I have no Hist, nor am I like to have. For I hold it wrong to mix colors except in services. In that you feel as a white man should. Though as for Harry, he would be all the same, whether his wife were a squaw or a governor's daughter, provided she was comely and would help keep his stomach full. Oh, you do march in injustice, Judith. No, Harry's greedy, selfish, and overbearing, ferocious. He's not like you, dear Slayer. You're manly and natural and honest. <laughs> Thank you, Judith. Thank you with all my heart. Harry is blunt. Uh, but listen, that's Chingakook. Come in, Chief. Time to meet Watawa. Yes, you're right, Delaware. I was forgetting. Well, I'm ready. We'll take the largest canoe and start for the rendezvous at once. Dearsley, how do you propose to rescue the Delaware girl? She's to meet us at the big rock when the big star shows in the north. Well, how can she get away from the Iroquois to meet you as you planned? Don't they hold her captive? Yes, but in the darkness, she may get away long enough to meet us if we're prompt. I don't think it is all likely that she's unobserved. Why? Well, the Iroquois must know that your friend Chingakook is here with us in the castle. Do you think they'll take their eyes off the girl even for a moment? They probably know about the chief here, all right. But since the girl has sent us word, we must not disappoint her if she tries to keep the appointment. Well, suppose she's not at the rock. What'll you do then? We go Mingo camp. Take wa when Mingo sleep. Oh, dear Slayer, do you intend to go into the Mingo camp? If you do not find wa at the rock, why, he's taking your life in your hands. Oh, very likely, gal. Oh, I tell you, this is folly. This bundle of sticks dipped in blood which they sent to the castle means that they'll give no quarter. What can you do against 40 or 50 cruel Indians? You must leave all that to our cunning, Judith. Now we'll find a way to take the girl. And we'll be back here at the castle before daylight. Are you ready, Chief? Canoe ready. We go take one, maybe three, four, mingo scalp. <sighs> then goodbye, dear Slayer, and good luck. You're going into a death trap. My instinct tells me a great evil awaits you. Be careful, dear Slayer. I will take no more chances than needed, Judith. And we'll be back again the rising of the sun. Goodbye. Goodbye. <laughs>
about to hear another episode of The Deerslayer, dramatized and directed by Charles Frederick Lindsley. has finally bought the freedom of Hurry Harry and old Tom Hutter by giving Rivenoak, the Indian chief, four small white ivory elephants. The two former captives are back on Hutter's houseboat with Deerslayer, Chingakook, Judith, and Hetty. Deerslayer and Chingakook have both come to the lake with the express purpose of rescuing from the Iroquois Chingakook's betrothed, Watawa, or Hist. Hist has sent word to her lover by Hetty that she will be waiting at a certain point just as the North Star makes its appearance. As this episode opens, Deerslayer and the Delaware chief are on the lake, heading for the designated point of meeting. They realize that their mission is a hazardous one and are proceeding with great caution. This is our first war path, Chingakook, but I hope we can bring Hist off with us without a fight with the Iroquois. Big Sarpan want Hist. Also, Mingo scat. Well, I can't argue against your redskin leader. But I shall not fire my rifle or use my knife except in self-defense. Night, much dark. Uh, it's so dark, I'm afraid we'll not have that star to help us. Do you think you can tell the time without it? We ought to arrive exactly at the moment. Time now for star. Three close. You take the canoe in the bank. I'll mind my rifle as we be paddling for an ambush. Look. Star show from cloud. Time come, we find his. Pull in, then we'll look around. But be on your guard. Let's stop right here a moment, Chief. If Hist has been waiting for us, she'll make herself known. Hist not come. Big sop and go Mingo camp. Steal when Mingo sleep. Don't forget, she may not be able to slip off here. The Mingos know now you have come to the lake. And they'll try to keep the gal out of sight. Yes, to be here. Star shine. Are you sure that this is the right place? Sop and sure. See star over big pine. Look, chief. See that fire? Do you know what that means? The varmints have moved their camp around to this pint. I'll wager your sweetheart is under guard this minute. <sighs> Sop and go, Iroquois camp. Wait a minute, Delaware. There's no gun in that. This is a tricky matter. We have to go with caution. Those voices are on the other side of the pint in that little bay. The thing for us to do is to slip around where we can do a little reconnoitering. Dear sir, go. Jingle Cook, wait here for Watawa. You go by self. She'll not come here, Sovereign. You come with me. And I'll show you your gal right in the middle of the Iroquois camp. They are, Sarpent. They have a good fire going. If we get in close, we can find out what's in their minds. Not many warrior in camp. They're not all here. But there's Riven Oak and about a dozen of the vomits. What do? Don't you see? They're admiring those little elephants, the beasts with two tails. Mm. Squaw look happy. Yes, they're feeling good about something. All except that old hag sitting off there by herself. What's wrong with her? Listen. What old squaw say? I can't understand. It was a command of some kind, I think. Look. Uh, what to what? Command yourself, Chief. Command yourself. It is the girl. But don't move. Don't you see? The old hag is his bodyguard. I told you she'd be watched. Mm, move close. Big pine. Sharp and call. What? Understand. Don't, don't even shut up like a squirrel. Just watch. Must act quick. Once more go to hut for night... 
Can't escape old squaw. Uma! Uma! Reven Oak is calling to the witch. What did he say, servant? Tell old squaw, go spring water. And she's taking her charge along. Where is the spring? Not know. Let's hope it's this way. If it is, we have a chance. Mm. Squaw, come this way. Good. Good. Now listen, chief. The canoe is 20 yards down this bank. Those braves are 50 yards from us. We've got to take a chance. When Hist and her old woman come by, I'll take care of the squaw. You take Hist to the canoe. I'll join you if I can. If not, shh. Here they come. Now, as soon as I grab her, call Hist and get away. Ah! Oh, big serpent, come! Stop it, you wretch. You're not dead. You'll have your voice back in a minute. Servant! Servant! Here, canoe! Jump quick, Mingo, come! Take my rifle while I shovel. We'll get to the castle in a moment if... Watch! Mingo, jump! Ah! Off you go, chief! Quick! I'll fight the way out! Let up, you devils! I'm no match for you. I'm your captive. Let up! Let up! Riven Oak, here I am, trussed up like a fowl. <laughs> but you're a short one Delaware girl, and I guess you'll never see her again. Pale face friend, welcome, much welcome. Iroquois keep fire, him dry, white man's clothes. I thank you, Mingo. Thank you for your welcome and your fire. Pale face name Hawkeye, eh? One of your braves gave me the name of Hawkeye. I suppose on account of a quick and sudden name. When he was lying with his head in my lap before his spirit started for the happy hunting grounds. Good name, Hawkeye. He sure him blow. Hawkeye him no woman. Why him live with Delaware Indian? Providence placed me among the Delawares when I was young. Iroquois redskin like Delaware. Hawkeye more Iroquois than woman. All Delaware ass. If you wish to get anything out of me, speak plainer. Because bargains can't be made tongue-tied. Good. Hawkeye, he no got forked tongue. Pale face, no muskrat. You mean Tom Hutter, I guess. Yes, I know him. I've been living on his castle in the lake. Muskrat, uh, him no white, him no red, no beast, no fish. Muskrat, him water snake. Him always uh, look pure on scalp. Yes, I must say that's true. But that's not my method. I take no scalps. And I've fought you only in self-defense. Do you understand that? Aye, uh, Rivenook, understand. Hawkeye, stout heart. Him no water snake. Rivenook, have plan. All right, tell it. Hawkeye, go back muskrat house. Tell old muskrat him escape from Iroquois. What then? When muskrat him eye in fog, Hawkeye, him open door for Rivenook. Oh, I see. I go back to the castle and tell old Tom I have escaped. Huh? I put him off his guard. Then you slip off in the middle of the night and I let you in. Huh? What then? Iroquois, come take scalp. Hawkeye, take all rest. Well, Riven Oak, this is plain English. And I must say your plan out devils even mingo deviltry. No, pale face, go. It'll be easy to go back and tell how I escaped from you. And gain some credit, too, by the exploit. Good, good. I see. When inside the house and eating the muskrat's bread and talking with his pretty daughters, I could put his eyes in such a fog he couldn't see the door. Good, Hawkeye, good Huron. Blood, not more than half white. You're mistaken there, Mingo. You're mistaken as much as if you mistook a wolf for a catamount. I'm white in blood, heart, nature, and gifts. What about this plan? When old Hutter's eyes are well befogged and Hurley Harry, the great pine as you taught him, is dreaming of anything but mischief... All I have to do is to set a torch somewhere in sight for a signal, open the door, and let in the Hurons to knock them all on the head. Uh, brother right. He cannot be white. He worthy to be great chief with Hurons. Now listen, Mingo, and hear a few honest words from an honest man. I'm a Christian born, and as long as earth lasts, I'll never lend myself to such wickedness. To do such would make me an outcast and vagabond. 
No upright pale face would do what you wish. And no upright Delaware either. With a Mingo, it may be different. No. I despise your offer. I'll not do it. Ah, uh, back, amigo, po. Pale face, him love muskrat? No. Uh, love muskrat daughter. Wild rose, sweet for bosom of white brother. Eh? Wild rose? You mean Judith, I guess. Her beauty has traveled the wilderness, I see. Well, she's comely enough. But my love is in the woods and on the trail of the buck. Why, my brother come here to lick, if not him come see Wild Rose. Hawkeye come here cause of little string held by girl? I did come because of a string held by a girl. But the other end was not fastened to my heart. The string you mean is passed to the heart of a great Delaware, Chingakook by name, or great Sarpent. He come here led by a string, and I followed. Oh, string him got two ends. Yes, and the other end is passed to the heart of a Mohican maiden, who was here close to the fire half an hour ago. You know what I mean. Watawa, the Delaware girl you stole from her people. She is now in the castle with the man who's going to be her husband. Oh, hello. 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 Oh, my squad. Bring back the scout giant with one. What's your name, warrior? You seem somewhat excited about something. Me, Kedema. What the war? Mine. You bring me back. Oh, I think I recognize you now. You're the farmer that just jumped on my back and kept me from pushing off with my friend. Your leap is long, Catamount. Pale face steel, Catamount squaw, dog, skunk, toad, spider, yandy! Pull out that knife, savage. I stole nothing. Your wife, as you call her, will never be the wife of a Mingo. Her mind is in the cabin of a Delaware, and her body has gone to find it. Catamount is active, I know, but your legs can't keep pace with a woman's wishes. Uh, Exotic dog, keep in water, afraid to stand on hard earth. Pink! Oh, Hawkeye, okay, make great mistake. Steal Caramon squaw. Refuse to help Ribbon Oak get Muskrat house. At last, I certainly do. What's your next move, Chief? Peel face him must stand at stake. God has put me in your hands, Mingo. And I know you will act your will on me. I'll not boast what I can do under torment. But go ahead. Fill up your fire. Look at your lives. Make your infernal racket. You'll never take Muskrat Castle with my help. You are about to hear another episode of The Deer Slayer, dramatized and directed by Charles Frederick Lindsley. Slayer is a captive in the Iroquois camp. He has offered his freedom if he will join the Indian band. When he refuses, Riven Oak, the chief, says he must die. The party in the castle has set out in the ark and has been skirting the shore in the darkness, thinking they may get sight of the enemy camp and in some way affect Deerslayer's release. But they have had no luck. The present act opens the following morning aboard the ark which is floating about a quarter of a mile from the castle. Hutter, Hurry Harry, the two Hutter girls, Chingakook and his betrothed, Wata Wah, are all quite depressed as they contemplate the fate of the young woodsman. I think the Redskins have probably moved back in the woods during the night. 
We have only three rifles, and they'll not be enough against 50 or more of the varmints. We better go back to the castle and wait developments. Maybe they'll leave this place alone now. Not so, Tom. The Riptles won't leave this shore as long as they know they have six scalps almost in their hands. We must do something, Father. We can't abandon this lay to torture and maybe death. Uh, he shouldn't have been so careless as to let the Mingos get their hands on him. Shame on you, Harry March. You forget that those same Mingos got their hands on you, Father. You'd still be their captives if Deerslayer hadn't furnished a ransom for you. Father, I know what to do. Let me go alone to the shore. I will go to the camp and talk to the Indian chief. He will listen to me again. And when I tell him the Bible says you should love your... Be quiet, Hattie. If you had more reason in your head, you'd know that that is child's talk. No. We will go back to Muskrat Castle and wait for them to smoke us out. Deerslayer will have to fight his own battle now. I think you're ungrateful. Maybe head is huh? right. Let huh? us see... Uh, what's the matter, Chingakook? You've been playing with that spyglass for half an hour. You see a chipmunk in a tree or a squirrel running... No around? good, go, Castle. You're on there. The devil he is. You're on there? Let me have the glass. Uh, pretty trap we're about to pull down on our heads. How could the Indians be at the castle, sister? Hush. I see no signs about the place except water and logs and bark. You've had this glass wrong end foremost, Delaware. How can you see a trail in the water? No trail. Water make no trail. Jingle Cook right. Stop boat. No go near. You run there. <laughs> That's right, Gail. Stick to the same tale, Sarpent. I hope you and your gal will agree in telling the same story at her marriage as well as you do now. See anything yet, Tom? If the Hurons are there, I don't know where they be. The place is locked up just as we left it. No see moccasin? Look, see moccasin. Give me the glass, Hunter. Why, there is a moccasin floating against one of the piles. It may be a sign that the castle has had visitors in our absence. I saw that, too. But moccasins are no rarities. I wear them myself, and so does Hetty. It's been caught on a piece of bark on one of the piles. But it might have caught there accidentally. How so? Well, it might have fallen from the platform when we were at home. Or it may have drifted up the lake and accidentally lodged there. Law know what to do. Law take canoe. Get moccasin. Bring back here. Law know if belong to Iroquois. A good idea, Tom. Let the gal have a canoe and fetch the thing. No good walk, go. Too much danger. Big sop and go. All right, Delaware, if you're so tender of your squaw. Anyway, it's but a piece of deer skin, not a scarecrow to frighten true hunters. In fact, I'm not afraid to go myself. Red man go. Better I than pale face. No, you're on trick. Yeah, you're wrong there, Injun. A white man's eyes and ears are better than a red skin's any time. But go ahead, Sarpent. Use your paddle and welcome. Sop and go. Bring moccasin. Wait. Maybe Indian inside. Ah, uh, impossible, Red Gal. How could the devils get in without breaking off the locks? Do you think they're spirits or something? Indian fool tricks. Maybe go through roof. Ah, uh, you're too suspicious. You'll give them Mingos too much credit. If they are there, why wouldn't they try to harm Chingakook? They wait. Think us go castle. Make all prisoners. Here comes Chingakook. He'll soon know what the Delaware's found. But I agree with Hurry. Moccasin don't mean anything. Anywhere the Delaware has shown he's no coward, it takes courage to paddle into a suspected ambush like that and then return here with his back to the enemy. Well, Serpent, what news from the muskrats? Did they show their teeth? Up with you and tell us what you discovered. Uh, uh, no light. Too still. So still, see, silence. That's downright Indian. As if anything could make less noise than nothing. Nice to sail, Tom. Let's have breakfast under your own roof. Where's the moccasin? Uh, here. You run mo moccasin. You run at castle. How do you know, War? Porcupine wheels on stunt. War, no. You run moccasin. Yes, you're right about that, gal. But it doesn't prove the enemies at the castle now. It may have fallen from the foot of one of the scouts that visited the place yesterday when we met them about the exchange of them white elephants. Up with the sail, Harry, and we'll be there in a few minutes. Judy, do you think Father is right? Do you think the Indians may be in the house? Oh, I can't say, sister. We've been away all night looking for deer sleigh, and it's possible that some of them have come off on rafts and are now lying in ambush. But how could they get in? Everything looks just as we left it. Let's go.
go, go, go into the cabin with Chingakook and Wall. If there is trouble, we'll be safer there. Tell me, Judy, do you fear anything will happen to Deer Slayer? Naturally, Hetty. The Iroquois have lost one of their warriors at his hand, and they've had the Delaware stolen from them because of his aid, and they'll be very angry and vindictive. Oh, don't you think I could be of help if I went to their camp? I went before, and they did not harm me. Oh, they'll not harm you, I know. But what argument could you make that will change their angry hearts? Chingakook, do you know what we can do to free Deerslayer? Tonight, Big Sop and go. Take Deerslayer when Mingo sleep. But if they capture you too, who will protect his, your sweetheart? He's no afraid. Deerslayer, his friend too. Delaware, more tricky than Mingo. Big Sark and find way. Well, here we are at the castle. We'll soon know if we have visitors. Oh, over there, hurry. Take in the sail while I tie up. Aye. Here you are, Sarpent. Take this line, and when hurry and me get off, tie up the ark to the platform and all of you come aboard. Chingakook, don't tie up, his father says. Just throw the rope over the head of that pile and let the ark drift around to the side of the castle. If the enemy is here, we'll be out of the line of their fire, and they'll not be able to get board us either. Come aboard, Tom. There's not a sign of the redskin. The place is locked as tight as we left it. Paste yourself up. Uh, look safe and sounds all right. Sure. The Delaware brags of being able to see silence. Let him come up here and feel it in the bargain. Any Give silence me the keys. where you are, hurry, ought to be both seen and felt. Come on in, Tom. Your tenement is safe and sound and as empty as a hollow walnut. Open those windows and let in some fresh air and tell the others. <laughs> <laughs> Carbon, go help clear face. No, 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 you mustn't. You've got to protect us now. Quick, do as I say. Oh, Judy, don't leave him alone. Can't we help in some way? No, of course not. Our only chance is to shove off and pray that Father and Hurry can fight their way out. How can they get off? There's a canoe there. They can get to it. Oh, but the Indians have rifles. I know. That's the reason we can't stay by. Oh, look, look. They're fighting on the platform now. Oh, Judy, I know Hurry will beat them. He must. He's like a giant. But there are six of them. He's throwing them in the water. Look, there's the second one. Come on, Tom. The rascals are taking the lake, and I'll soon have them all swimming. Take that, some Margaret. Come on, you pagan devils. See if Hurry Harry isn't a match for us. I told you, Judy, I told you. They can't take him. He's too strong for all of them. There are only two left now. Oh, where's Father? He's fighting inside or else they've captured him. Harry's choking both of them at once. Oh, it's awful, Judy, but the one he threw in the water is climbing up the stockade. He doesn't see him. What is that in his hand? It's a rope of bark. Oh. oh, it'll all be over now, sister, unless Father can get away. Harry will be tied up helpless as a log. Why have they all rushed inside the castle? To join in a fight against Father. Chingakook, listen. We're only 50 yards away. Force the ark back. Toward the platform. I have a plan. Quick. Just as fast as you can. What are you going to do? We'll rescue Harry. If we're quick about it. The Indians are so busy inside. They're paying no attention to us. But we can't land. No, wait. Harry. Harry, listen. As we're drifting close, roll over the edge and fall into the water. I'll throw you a rope and Chimbacook will pull you off until we can get you aboard. All right, Judy. You'll have to be fast about it. Ready? Judy, you'll drown. His hands and feet are tied. No, no, no. You're too much of a fish for that. If he gets the rope in his hands, he can swim underwater until we pull him free of the Iroquois rifles. He's caught it. Pull now, Chingakook, as fast as you can. Judy, the Indians have discovered what we've done. <gasps> keep inside the cabin. They'll not touch Harry if we can keep him underwater. Hurry, Chingakook. They'll have to reload now. Hold up, Sarpent. Give me help with this rope. Pull Harry up past the end of the skull. We'll be out of danger then, and we can get him on board with us. Harry, keep a lookout on the other side and tell us if the Indians take to the water. All safe, Judith. You're a smart girl. Now take the sweeps again, Chingakook, until Harry gets his breath and get as far away as you can. But, Judy, father, don't leave father. I, I don't like to tell you, girls, but we can't help him now. Oh. The Mingos have taken another scalp. Oh, he's hard news. But it's poor time for grief now. Harry March, there's but one possible chance for our escape. What's that? We'll get to a shore tonight. We'll, you'll find your way to the garrison on Lake Mohawk, and you'll bring the soldiers as fast as you can get them words.
You are about to hear another episode of The Deer Slayer, dramatized and directed by Charles Frederick Lindsley. Hutter and his family were in the ark, skirting the shore of the lake, looking for Deerslayer, who is a prisoner in the enemy camp. The Iroquois entered Muskrat Castle and laid an ambush for the returning family. A desperate fight was waged, in which Hutter lost his life. But Harry March escaped by rolling off the platform into the water, where he was rescued by Chingakook and the girls who had remained aboard the ark. The situation is a critical one, and Judith tells March that there is but one way of escape for them. He must take to the woods and try to bring the soldiers from the garrison to their assistance. In the meantime, Deerslayer had managed to escape from his captors. After a long chase through the woods, he reached the lake and pushed off in a canoe from which the paddle had been removed. He tried to drift away from the shore, but the wind was against him, and he suddenly found himself again in the clutches of his pursuers. Come, my young friend, him sail about until him tired... Him forget how must use legs. You have the best of it, Huron. I am your prisoner again. But it's a good thing your brave took the paddle out of this canoe or you'd never seen me again. My young friend, him moose. Legs much long. Give my young men lot trouble. Now him try be fish. Why didn't you shoot me? Fish taken nets, not killed by bullets. When him turn moose, you're on shoot. Well, I'm your captive again. Work your will on me. Has my brother seen enough to make him change mind and hear reason? Speak out, Huron. Something is in your thoughts. And the sooner it's said, the sooner you'll get my answer. Good. Pale face eyes not shut now. My brother him have killed two Huron braves. One husband, other him brother of squaw, Sumac. Sumac now all alone. No one to hunt for her. Fill lodge with venison. You great hunter... You make Sumac your squaw, live with Huron. I have heard of men saving their lives in this way, but I'm white, and it goes against my nature. No, chief, I prefer death to such captivity. Paleface, think of this while my people make counsel. Tomahawks and Big Fire make Paleface brother talk. We go. Name of Deerslayer will be called. God's will be done on earth as in heaven. I did hope my days would not number so soon, but it matters little after all. A few more winters and a few more summers, and it would have been over. The young and active seldom think death possible till he grins in their faces and tells them the hour has come. Dear Slayer, dear Slayer. Hattie, what are you doing here? Are you a prisoner too? I'm no prisoner, dear Slayer, but a free girl. The Indians will not hurt me. But they're all around us here in the woods. Even the women and children are on the lookout. I came here alone, as I've often done, and I'm not afraid. Oh, dear Slayer, do you know what has happened at the castle? No. Is everyone safe? Is Hunter... Father is dead. Dead? The Hurons managed to get inside the castle by cutting a hole in the roof. But the rest of you? When the fight began, we pushed away on the ark. And Hurry? Hurry's gone ashore. He's on his way to the garrison to bring the soldiers. Ah, it's a long chance, gal. It may be a week before he can bring help. You must go back to the ark and tell Chingakook to take the trail when it's dark and strike for the Delaware camp. Shh. He comes the chief. Uh, the council has had their talk, I guess. And they're ready for the sacrifice. As soon as you can, slip away and deliver my message. A killer of the deer, my people make decision. So it looks. Tomahawk sharp, fire soon ready. Oh, you must not hurt, dear Slayer. God will be angry. He'll face him, kill two Huron. God already angry. Let me show you what the Bible says. Love your enemy. Oh, no time to hear. It's no use, Hetty. My hour has come, and what must be must. If you're bent on torture, Mingo... I'll do my endeavors to bear up again it. No, Huron will see a pale-faced Delaware woman dressed in skin of Yankee. Have your say, Chief. But talking can't make knives sharper or fire hotter. I am ready. Tie me up. Eh? 
and deer slayer, and feel that the knives of the warriors, him will change mind and live with Huron. I'm already given my answer to that, and I'll not change my mind. But isn't this tree too small? Can your braves hit a sapling like this? Well, they shall see. All ready, Mingos. Go away, or your tomahawk will forget its horn. Ah, uh, that's no good, big moose. Give your brother a chance now. Come on, Catamount, stop your looping about like a fawn. Them silly antics. Oh, that's closer, but you only clipped my hair that time. See if you can't touch the scalp now. Maybe your squaws are handier with them hatchets. Come up closer. Take more time. Get a better aim. It's your turn, Bowling Boy. Don't miss, or the Huron cows will laugh in your face. <laughs> pretty close, Redskin, pretty close. It'll take a long time to shave my head that way. I'll hold still this time and give you a chance. Send out your best marksman, Riverhawk, or the sun will fall before you get to the end of this. Oh, killer of the deer, him brave. He no Delaware squaw. Maybe he changed mind. Stay with Huron. Be great hunter. Chief, maybe. Go eh? on with your deviltry. I have no desire to betray my white nigger but trifling with your flattery. My warriors now try rifles. Let them begin. A rifle is more merciful than a stone hatchet. And maybe they'll have better aim with white man's weapons. But come closer, Mingos. You'll never hit it 50 paces. Ah, you may call this shooting, Mingos, but I've known Dutch gals on the Mohawk that could outdo you. Undo these arms of mine. Put a rifle in my hands, and I'll pin the thinnest warlock in your party to any tree you can show me at a hundred yards or two hundred. Oh, stop, stop. Don't torture dear Slayer. He's not your enemy. Dear Slayer, his Judy. Judith, why are you here? Which is the chief, dear Slayer? I have an important message for him. Rivenoak, chief. Rivenoak, him speak English. Let flower of wood speak. Look at me, Huron. You can see I'm no common woman. My daughter, handsome as wild rose. Listen, the English have young men as well as the Huron. Yankees plenty as leaves on trees. Yes. Suppose I'd brought a party with me. There would have been a great fight, and the trail of the Iroquois would have been marked with blood. Much blood already on trail. All Huron blood. No doubt. And more Huron blood would have been spilt if I had come with pale faces. River North loves little animals made of ivory. I have brought some with me. Take them and start for your village. Leave Deerslayer with me. And see, here's a two-barreled rifle. Let not a keep two-tailed dog can eat when venison is scarce. Deerslayer cannot quit the young men now. It'll not do, Judith. You thought that fine dress would make him think you a queen. But River Oak is an uncommon man. You should have stayed in the ark. Anything to gain time, Deerslayer. Your friends are not idle. Stand back, Judith, and wait. The devils are going to try fire now. Killer of the deer has been brave. No afraid of knives or tomahawks. Cure now see if he like to taste fire. I've never been tested this way before, Chief. But you'll find me ready for your punishment. Oh, why do you torment, dear Slayer? He's your friend. When Father and Harry Harry came after your scalps, he refused to be one of the party. He stayed in the canoe by himself. My daughter, welcome to speak. You're unglad to hear a voice. Great spirit often speak with such tongue. This time her eyes not wide open. Two of Huron warriors fall by blows of pale face. Go sit by Sumac. Now, young pale face brother, River look, see if you kill with stout heart or by treachery like a leaping panther. Soon the fire be up to mouth. Uh, this is my end, Mingo. But you'll see what a white man can do when called on to stand at the stake. Now, my brother Bolt. No. I may be unfortunate in your prisoner, but I'm no bolster. Stop! You shall not kill him this way. Oh, stop! See this pale-faced girl. Tie her to trees. Listen, Reverend Oak, listen. What do you hear? Huh? It's the soldiers. I warned you. <laughs> now it's too late. Quick, Miss Claire. Now I cut these ropes. They've come in time. It was not a minute too soon, Judith. I didn't hope for such a miracle. How could the soldiers get here so soon? Harry must have met them on the way to the garrison. Where's Chingakook and Hist? Hetty and I left them on the ark. He'll probably join us as soon as he hears these rifles. Who's this, Judith? It's Captain Wally from the fort. Well, it looks like we arrived in the nick of time, Judith. Is this the young man your messenger told us about? This is Deerslayer, Captain Wally. And you did arrive in time. The bingos had hardly lighted the fire. Did Harry Harry come back with you? <laughs> He's in Canada by this time. He seemed in a hurry to get as far away as he could. Yes, Harry is well named. I suppose you'll all return to the garrison with us? I came to this lake with a Delaware friend to rendezvous his sweetheart. And now that this affair with the Mingos is over, I shall return with him to his village. 
I know it's no use to argue with you, dear Slayer. You love the woods and the life of the wilderness. You would not be happy in the towns of the whites. That's right, Judith. More than that, this war with the Iroquois is just beginning. There'll be need of my services for many months and maybe years to come. But when this bloody business is all over, maybe you will return to this spot. I know no place more beautiful than Glimmerglass. But I cannot foresee the time when I can settle to the peace and quiet of such a retreat. No, Judith, my years are young. The frontier with all its peril is my home. You will go to the garrison for the time. I shall go with Chingakook and his betrothed. But it may not be long before we meet again. I thank you, friend, from the depth of my heart for all your kindness and your courage. Where is the ark? I'm sure it's at hand. You'll go with us to the castle until our plans can be made. Yes. But tomorrow's sun will see Chingakook on his way home. And you? I shall go too, Judith. But it will not be long till I will be at the garrisons to act as guide for some party through these dangerous woods. And we may meet again. What's that? It's Chingakook calling from the ark. Come. Let us go. (laughs) 